If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. We've got General McGill Alexander with us again. And uh, fascinating man. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. I think we are heading towards Taiwan today. And I'm looking forward to this episode. So it's over to you, sir. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, Chris, I think uh, before I, I, uh, I go into the detail of uh, my deployment to uh, Taiwan, uh, I do need to give a, a few points in the background. I did discuss the, on the previous one, um, the previous conversation, I spoke about the military attaché course that we attended. Um, and uh, one other thing about that course that I think I, I should mention is that um, during the course, we, we were uh, asked to, uh, to write a, a staff paper, um, uh, which uh, cons would concern the country that we'd been selected to go to. So uh, I wrote a 28-page a, a staff paper. I, I researched it very, very carefully. And uh, I uh, and uh, what what we we had to do is write about military representation in the country that we are going to, uh, how we saw military representation in the country we are going to. And uh, I titled my my staff paper "Republic or People's Republic: The Chinese Dichotomy." Now uh, the problem is that uh, there were and there are two Chinas. There's the uh, Republic of China on Taiwan, and there's the People's Republic of China on the mainland. And that's what I wrote about. And um, I, I went into a lot of detail about the situation, both in those countries and in the world internationally, how those countries were seen in the world, and, and um, what the the tendency is in South Africa because it had become very cl clear to me in the in the year since we'd been appointed and told that that's where, that's where we were going to. It had become cl increasingly clear to me that uh, it was only a matter of time, and we would change um, diplomatic representation from Taipei to Beijing. That was going to happen. It was inevitable. Uh, any any fool would know that. And, and the Taiwanese people knew that. And, and Taiwan was working extremely hard at that stage to uh, try to ensure that they got the best possible deal. Uh, they were wooing the ANC like you cannot believe. They were pumping millions into South Africa. Uh, they, were, they were trying very hard at best to retain diplomatic representation, but at worst, to have a very good post-move uh, situation on, on Taiwan. Uh, and the, I mean, the Chinese are, are uh, uh, you know, they, they don't go at a thing in a half-hearted fashion. Uh, they, they go at it all out and, and, and they are intense in the way they approach things. And they, uh, they were certainly uh, doing a uh, 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 following a concerted program from the on from Taiwan to uh, whatever happened to get the best possible deal out of this for the benefit of their country for the benefit of Taiwan which is quite understandable but it was clear that the the change was coming and um, I could no longer understand what the point was in sending me to Taipei if we were going to change. And, and, you know, regardless of what the bumptious brigadier had said to me at the, uh, at the uh, uh, interview that we'd had at the, where, where the, um, the selection board that we appeared before, um, regardless of what he said, the fact is that it was, it was coming and it was going to happen. And if the people at the Defense Forces Directorate, Directorate of Foreign Relations could not understand that, then somebody needed to tell them that. And I told them that in the paper that I wrote. I, I made it very, very clear. Uh, and I, I recommended military representation in Beijing 
and pointed out the need for us in the Defence Force to take the initiative and to do so even unofficially before the inevitable political decision was made. Uh, there simply was, was no sense in appointing um, a new military attaché in Taipei on the eve of one of this change that was going to take place. Uh, because there were m massive expenses involved. Uh, uh, there was all sorts of disruptions involved, personal disruptions for the people concerned, but also disruptions in, the, in terms of the, 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 the military effort that was going, went into something like this. Um, I addressed my staff paper to the chief of the South African National Defense Force um, because I felt that this was something that was important enough to be looked at at the top, top echelon. Um, unfortunately, it had to be submitted through DFR, the, the, the um, Directorate of Foreign Relations in the military. And that is unfortunate because uh, the, the uh, director of, uh, of, of that di directorate <clears throat> would take a look at that uh, paper, probably wouldn't read it, but would read my recommendations at the end and uh, then decide, well, this is, this is not going to the chief of the defense force because I, I never heard anything. It was, I was, it, it was never acknowledged. Uh, nobody responded to it. And I can almost guarantee that it never reached the chief of the national defense force. So I just say that for, for background. And as the year went on and the time came for us to depart, it became clear we're going to go. Um, so we must just make the absolute best of it. Now, some of the, um, some background to, to Taiwan, which I think I, I, I should mention uh, before I, 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 I get on to my actual uh, move to Taiwan. Um, as I said, there were two Chinas, the ROC and the PRC, and we were going to the ROC. Um, after the Second World War, um, the five permanent members of the um, United Nations Security Council, the ones who had the veto right, included China. Uh, there was the US, uh, there was France and Germany, and uh, not Germany, there was, there was France and China, and um, uh, there was Russia. Um, so so th these, these all had a permanent representation in the Security Council. In other words, they didn't rotate like all the other members, <clears throat> and they had a veto right. So this was a powerful position that China found itself in. And... Um, Prior to the Second World War, there had been a tremendous battle going on within China between the communists and the nationalists. And the nationalists were in power, the, the Kuomintang, Kuomintang, Kuomintang they, they were the, uh, the, the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek. And um, the, the communists under Mao Zedong um, were set on taking over the government. But when the Second World War broke out, they um, put away their differences to fight the common enemy, which was the Japanese. But at the end of the war, the Second World War, the Chinese Civil War got, went into full swing between the nationalists and the communists. Um, and the, uh, Ultimately, there was a communist victory. The communists under Mao Zedong drove the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek out. And they were driven onto two large islands off the coast of China, Hainan and uh, Taiwan. Um, they didn't stay on Hainan for very long. Uh, they moved off of there because it was untenable for them to defend the two islands. So they were established just on Taiwan and some small surrounding islands around Taiwan. Um, the, the, the situation in Taiwan, uh, a bit of background to it, as an island, uh, it was known in the West originally as, or not originally, but for a long time as Formosa. Um, the, the, the Portuguese uh, and the Dutch were active in that area in the early exploration time of the, the of Western Europe, 
um, and 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 Formosa is a is a a, a word uh, uh, from from the Portuguese uh, meaning uh, flowers, the, the the island of flowers, a beautiful island of flowers. Um, and and there's a, a still a, a fort from colonial days, uh, a trading fort that is standing on the on the island of Taiwan. <clears throat> then. At the conclusion of the Sino-Japanese War in 1895, um, Taiwan, the island, was ceded to the Japanese. And, and for the following 50 years, it was occupied by the Japanese until the end of the Second World War. Um, the Japanese... Um, they they developed the infrastructure on the island because it had been a very primitive little island, uh, tropical island. Uh, nobody didn't seem to have any resources. Nobody was really interested in it, and uh, it had a a, a, a Polynesian uh, um, native population, not a Chinese uh, population. But there were a lot of Chinese living there. But but uh, the, the 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 original inhabitants were a Polynesian uh, Aborigine group. Um, the 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 Japanese imposed their own culture on Taiwan, uh, and their their their, their Taoist uh, um, were. They ruled it with an iron fist. The um, the Chinese and um, the Aborigines were not um, they, they 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 were not given a very uh, uh, a, a great deal of freedom under the under the Japanese. Um, during the Second World War, the Japanese established a notorious POW camp on Taiwan. It was known as Kinkaseki. And uh, uh, after the fall of Singapore, the uh, a lot of prisoners were taken to Kinkaseki. There were well over a thousand allied prisoners there, mostly uh, uh, British, um, Australian and Canadian uh, prisoners on, on that island. And, and they had to, had to work a mine on the island. Um, in horrendous conditions, a third of those prisoners died uh, during the uh, the war. They were eventually uh, freed by the Americans when they they landed uh, on Taiwan and took over at the end of the war. But when the uh, and of course then the Chinese took over Taiwan again, and uh, that was of course the nationalist government. And when the nationalist government was driven off the mainland and established themselves in Taiwan. Um, it was a massive population influx, a massive several million people that came onto Taiwan. And, and they outnumbered and swamped the locals, including the, the Aborigines, who were a relatively small group. Um, but the, the Chinese are a very, very industrious people and a very hardworking people. And the arrival of the nationalists, although although the island was swamped by all these people and it was a, a, a living under a tremendous strain, uh, they were highly organized and, and they set about programs to make things work on the island. And so it was that uh, there was a massive growth in the infrastructure and the economy. Uh, the island had had no real economy of its own before that. But the the uh, the Chinese people built up a an impressive economy so much so so that they became one of the four Asian tigers, the the the, the so called little dragons of the of the Far East, and uh, uh, those th those four were were Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, and Taiwan. And and they were the 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 economic growth in those four was incredible after the Second World War. Um, 
And and to this day, you go to any one of those four, and and they are a stark contrast to almost any other country in in uh, uh, in in Asia. Uh, and I would say in most of the world, uh, they they are just it's just phenomenal what they have done. So. Taiwan was by no means just a little backward island anymore. It was a, a prominent organization in the uh, in, in in world uh, uh, affairs, a prominent state uh, with a, a very real capability. Uh, and and they they saw as their their main resource was their people, and so they developed their people. They had a very high standard of education, a very a, a very good educational system. In fact, they, their children were placed under huge pressure in the schools to perform and to do well. And to this day, when you encounter Taiwanese people, they're well-educated and they are industrious. They are hardworking. They make things happen. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that was why the country grew the way it was. And of course, <coughs> they embraced a capitalist view, not a democratic view, but a capitalist view. Uh, politically, Chiang Kai-shek ruled with a with a fist of iron. Um, uh, so it was it was not a democratic society at all, but it was a, a capitalist society where the economy grew phenomenally and the the standard of living of the people gradually climbed until they were up in the in the upper echelons, way ahead of what was going on in communist China. Where the communist policies were creating total misery and disaster, and and uh, Mao Zedong's uh, uh, programs and 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 policies were were and 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 uh, his, his uh, um, suppression of minorities was uh, it it was causing untold suffering. Um, what the what the the Chinese on Taiwan did and did so well, and what made such a difference in that country was their implementation of their policies. They would get a policy, put it in place, and they would implement it. They were ex expert at implementing policies, something which we seem to have forgotten in South Africa. We think if you make a law, then the problem is solved. If you, if you in introduce a policy in parliament, then the problem has been solved. The problem is not solved until you implement it. And we don't seem to know how to implement anything. Uh, certainly not implementing law and order or, or, or things like that. So the, the, the Chinese were just very good at implementing. We could learn a great deal from them. Um, they focused on vocational training. Training people, not sending them to university just for the sake of getting a degree, they were vocationally trained for where the need lay. Uh, when they first arrived, they had a huge army of people. Army, they were literally military people and their families that had swamped to Taiwan. And, and what the Kuomintang did was they, they introduced work programs. And those veterans, those soldiers, were put to work building roads, railways, uh, bridges. They were doing hard labor, but they were working. They were getting paid for it, and they were working, and they were building the infrastructure so that the economy could grow. And uh, they were just very, very good at this. They didn't, they, they, they didn't shy away from hard work, hard physical labor. Nothing was too low or too menial for them. They just got it done. Um, I would say that the vocational training in Taiwan today still and the benefits of the, that are given to uh, veterans, military veterans, even those who are in recent years have just been called up, have been conscripted and done their, their service, they're regarded as veterans. And they have an unbelievable veterans organization and a network that sees to the people who have served in the military and make sure that those people are trained for jobs in the civilian sector. And I would say that it's probably the finest in the world. They have an organization called VACRS, V-A-C-R-S, Vocational Assistance um, uh, Commission uh, for Retired Servicemen, I think it is. But it's, it's, the, the VACRS organization is unbelievable. They have hospitals. They have, they have pharmaceutical organizations. Uh, they, they, have, they have all sorts of 
training schools. Um, so they, they, they really are good. They really are good. Um, then a, a couple of aspects on the more international side of Taiwan. Uh, the distance from the mainland to the island of ta Taiwan is only 180 kilometers. So the Taiwan Straits are a, a narrow strait. And um, there are even a few little islands that are occupied by Taiwan, by the ROC, that are so close to the mainland that you can stand on the island. And I went to m m many of those islands. Uh, they're very small islands, but they've got garrisons on them, uh, Taiwanese garrisons, uh, and they've got defensive uh, uh, works uh, facing the uh, the uh, uh, the Chinese mainland. And you can stand there and you can look across onto the mainland. You can look at the towns and the the establishments on the mainland. I mean, they're, they're that close, a, a couple of kilometers away. Um, so it's uh, it's quite a, a strange situation. And, and after that civil war, after they'd been driven onto these islands and onto Taiwan, <clears throat> there were several attempts by the mainland to capture those islands. And they all failed. They were driven back by the, uh, by, by the nationalist forces. And that gives you an, an indication that the force of the military on Taiwan is not just a, they're just not, not, not just a handful of, uh, of conscripts. They're, they're a very professional military. Um, the Taiwanese military is largely armed by the United States. And they are protected by the United States. Although the United States recognizes uh, um, mainland China, uh, they are still, uh, uh, they've, they, they have warned mainland China to leave Taiwan alone. Don't try to invade and take over Taiwan by force because we will act against you. So you've got this constant tension in that part of the world. Um, the the the, the recognition of the, the People's Republic. In, in, in 1971, um, the United Nations recognized the People's Republic. And that meant that Taiwan, the ROC, lost its seat, its permanent seat on the Security Council. And that was taken over by the communists in, 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 in main, on mainland China in 1971. And not only did Taiwan lose their seat on the Security Council, they could no longer be a part of the United Nations because they, know they were now not, not recognized as a nation. Uh, so having gone from one of the five most powerful countries in the world, overnight they were kicked out and they were no longer recognized. And after the United, the United States um, in 1979, also withdrew its diplomatic recognition from Taiwan. Many other countries started doing the same. And uh, this meant that, that Taiwan now had a, a status as one of the pariah states of the world. So it fell in line with countries like Israel uh, and Chile and Paraguay and, of course, South Africa. Those were the pariah states in the world now. And those pariah states, automatically, they started to move closer to one another and started to, to assist one another where they could. And we had many exchanges with Taiwan. Um, we had people who went there on course, um, uh, uh, a lot of naval exchanges because they had a very big navy in Taiwan. It, uh, uh, much of the, 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 the many of the ships and the, the submarines and so on they had were very old. So much of their navy was uh, obsolete uh, or obsolescent, and um, but they were quite big. There's no doubt about that. They they had quite a big capability, and they continued to have very close relations with the United States. The United States closed their embassy, uh, but they had a thing in Taiwan called the American Institute in in, in Taiwan. It was nothing more than an embassy. Uh, they had no, it, it was an embassy, in fact. Uh, but it didn't have a name. Yeah, otherwise, it did everything that the embassy did. Um, and, and, and the United States continued to protect 
Taiwan. So, so this is the the critical situation that you have there. The 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 PRC, the the communists, really would like to take over Taiwan, and there's no doubt that they could do it today. They've built up their their, their military strength. I mean, they have the largest military in the world, and and they they could certainly invade and take over Taiwan. But the implications with what the Americans have said they would do, uh, it it's a possibility of a of a world war starting. So, you know, there's they are a bit reluctant to do that, and they've also come to realize that there's you can gain far more on the economic field than you can on the on the political and the military field. <coughs> you can gain more that's of lasting value to you, and and that's what the Chinese are doing largely today. Um, eventually, there was. There was only a, a handful of countries that maintained re- diplomatic recognition of, of Taiwan, and most of them were little countries that no one had ever heard of, you know, uh, little islands and, and, and so on. A few South American countries, South and Central American countries. And um, the largest and most influential country that continued to recognize Taiwan was South Africa. But after 1994, the government changed. Uh, the Chinese had always, the mainland Chinese, the communist Chinese, had always been supportive of the liberation movements. <coughs> and there was just no way that they could continue with the situation. So everybody knew it had to change. Um, the, the situation with the military attaches um, in Taiwan was was a strange one. Obviously, there were very few. In fact, I think there were only about four or five r- recognized military attaches who wore uniform. And as I say, they were mostly from, you know, little South American countries that uh, held no great sway anywhere uh, and were very, very poor. And, you know, I, I, I got the impression that in some cases, they were so poor that the Taiwanese actually paid for their, their embassy to exist and for them to bring people over and have a military attache and all the rest of it. That, that, those expenses were paid for by, by Taiwan. They were buying the military the recognition, a the little bit of recognition that they had. <clears throat> and of course, that's the way the Chinese work. Uh, you, you buy anything. Uh, you bribe anything. Anything works with them when it comes to it. Money is what gets you what you want. And that largely has been how they've survived. Um, so you had this small handful of official attaches who, interestingly enough, all, all were from Spanish-speaking countries. So uh, Anne and I, when we went over there, we could use our, our Spanish. So whenever we were with at any sort of function, where all the military attaches were, the official military attaches, uh, we spoke a lot of Spanish. And uh, we would sometimes have them over to our home and, you know, we would chat to them in Spanish and so on, which was nice that we could actually utilize that, uh, that, that uh, ability. But then you had the unofficial attaches. And the unofficial attaches were actually the more important ones in Taiwan. They didn't wear uniform. They were at the American Institute, AIT, in, in Taiwan, or they were at the, the French Institute there that they had, that the French, the French also had a, a, an unofficial embassy there. The Israelis had an unofficial embassy over there because uh, the Israelis had never officially recognized Taiwan as, a, as a, an independent country, but they, they had very close military relations and so on. Um, and and uh, you had the the South Koreans, uh, they had an unofficial military uh, 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 a, a military attaché there at their little unofficial embassy. So it was a strange situation that you had, and and all of those attachés, um, if they didn't speak English as their home language, like the Americans. Uh, the others, the French, the uh, uh, South Koreans, and the uh, the Israelis, they all they all could speak English. So when we had anything to do with the unofficial attaches, then we could speak English. 
So, you know, between English and Spanish, we were able to communicate very well within the attache core, if you could call it that. Um, the military attaches in, in those unofficial em embassies were all so-called retired officers. Now, I, I don't think for one minute that any of them were retired. Uh, they were just wearing civilian clothes. But they were uh, retired colonels who were serving uh, as, as sort of a retirement job that they'd got to, uh, to represent any military interests. But considering the extent of the military interests, I mean, in Taiwan, they flew Mirage fighters. Uh, uh, they, uh, the, the, all the, the naval training that was given to the Taiwanese and the Marine Corps training was American. Uh, uh, the links between Taiwan and Korea on an economic level were extremely strong. Um, so, uh, you know, th these people were not just tired old uh, passed over colonels that were serving there. They were, they were very competent. And most of them spoke Chinese fluently, Mandarin fluently, which was the official Chinese uh, 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 dialect that was spoken in, in or, or language that was spoken in, in Taiwan. Um, so it was a very interesting situation with the, um, with the official and unofficial military attaches. And when they'd arrange a tour for, because once a year they would arrange a, a special tour for all the military attaches and their families. And they'd take us around to all sorts of places and they'd uh, treat us and we'd stay in fancy hotels and they'd take us uh, uh, um, snorkeling and they'd take us uh, on sightseeing tours and, and in boats and, and, and a, a lovely tour that they would take for about a week. They'd take all the attaches, attaches on. It would include both the official and unofficial attaches. So, you know, none of this fooled anybody. Everybody knew what the re reality was, but, but you didn't talk about it. It was just the way things were done. <coughs> and in fact, we became very friendly with some of the unofficial attaches, particularly the Israeli and the, uh, and the American. But amongst the official attaches, the ones who wore uniform, most of them, their tours came to an end about six months after we arrived there. So within six months of my arriving there, I found myself as the, the doyen of the attache corps, the military attache corps. Uh, and, and internationally in the different countries, the doyen is always the sort of the most senior military attache who is there. So, you know, I was only been there six months and I found myself the most senior military attache and the doyen of the attache corps. Because I said they, they were, they, there were so few of them that if they changed, if, if, if three of them changed, uh, were replaced, uh, then, then the whole attache corps was replaced. So it, it wasn't quite like other countries with, as far as the military attache corps was concerned. Um, what one needs to remember about Taiwan is that uh, certainly at the time that I went there, they had at that stage the 10th largest armed forces in the whole world. So it, it wasn't a, a, a little lucky packet uh, uh, defense force that they had. Their armed forces were big and, and they were significant and they were well-trained and they hadn't been in a war for quite a long time, but they were living under a, the constant threat of a war. So, you know, they were in that, they were very similar in that respect to the situation that the Israelis found themselves in. So they, they kept themselves at a high pitch uh, of, of, of training. Um, they also had a very good armament industry. Um, uh, it wasn't so good in terms of replacing everything that they had, but they were able to produce their own, uh, uh, what they called the... Uh, uh, what was it? The IDF, I think they called it the uh, uh, Internal Defense Fighter or, or something like that. Uh, it was a fighter aircraft that they had had built with, uh, no doubt, a lot of American uh, um, inputs. Um, but as I say, they also flew the Mirage 2000 and they, they, they flew, um, what were they, uh, the 
Amer American, uh, I think it, I can't remember whether it was the F-15 or F-16, It was, but, but it was one of the more modern American fighters that they also flew. Um, but solely on the condition that they were used solely for defense, not for, for aggression. Um, so it, it, was, it was really, uh, you know, it, it was quite a challenge and an eye-opener for me to, to find out just how, how big and impressive the Taiwanese Defense Force actually is. Um, but as I say, a lot of their stuff, particularly naval-wise, was, was obsolete, was, was old. Um, so then we get to our departure, our uh, heading for Taiwan. As far as our children were concerned, um, our eldest daughter was at commenced with her, uh, well, she was in her final year for her uh, bachelor's degree in, in social work at uh, Stellenbosch. So she, of course, stayed behind to continue that. Um, the, uh, our middle daughter had finished her matric and she was enrolled at the, um, the, the uh, Technicon in Pretoria, so she stayed behind. Um, and our youngest daughter was only 10 years old at that stage, so she was still at school. And she came along with us. Now, our eldest daughter did go with us when we initially went over and spent a, a few weeks with us before her vacation started. Uh, and the the state actually paid for her to on her for her longer vacations that she could come across to us. So we saw quite a bit of her while we were over there. Um, the other daughter, who only stayed at the Technicon for a year, uh, was also able to come across on the one the long vacation that she had. But then at the end of that first year, she decided to join the defense, the, the Air Force, and, and that's what she did. So uh, we didn't see her uh, again uh, in Taiwan after that. Uh, but, but Melanie, the eldest one, came to Taiwan quite a few times and spent quite a lot of time with us over there. Um, one important thing that I must, I must mention here is um, one member at, at DFR, at the Directorate for Foreign Relations, and, and she was the only, the only bright shining light that I encountered in my dealings, all my dealings with the Directorate of Foreign Relations. Her name was Sharon Skutenberg. Um, I think she was uh, a, a military person. I think she was a sergeant major, but you know, most of the people in DFR, it was... Uh, they, they never wore uniform. They were too important to wear uniform. They wore civilian clothes. They, they were part of the, the intelligence community, and the intelligence community were far too important to, and, and uh, they, they, they didn't want to be recognized, and so they all wear civil. So I, I think Sharon may have been uh, military. I, I, she, I have an idea that she was a, a sergeant major or something, but, but she was unbelievable that that woman's capability she she did everything when it came to administrative work uh, when it came to the backups when it came to to support that we needed the only person i could rely on that i knew would react and would do something about any problem i had was sharon uh, unfortunately sharon didn't deal with the uh, the, the the actual work that I was doing in Taiwan. So on that, that level, I couldn't refer those sort of problems to her. But any administrative problem, any personal problem, anything, uh, a problem that we had with our children, with getting them back, with making bookings for them, with uh, um, uh, contact with them, anything like that, she was the person to contact and she was absolutely amazing. So I, I, I really have to mention that woman because... Uh, She's, she's still a friend of ours to this day and uh, a very good friend. So, uh, you know, I, I, I really, I, I can't speak highly enough of, of her and her professionalism and, the, and uh, her concern for every person that she worked with. Um, we, we, when we went over, uh, the incumbent military attaché in uh, the Armed Forces attaché in Taiwan uh, had he suggested to us that we we spend a couple of days in Hong Kong on our way over? Uh, he said it would be a a good transition for us from the west to the east and to get accustomed to you know the the, the culture and so on. So so he arranged for us to be booked into a hotel in Taiwan, uh, in in Hong Kong, and um, 
we spent a couple of days there. Well, it was it it was magnificent. I think we were only there for two days, but it was it it was really great. It was a it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful exposure to uh, to this completely new way of life and this new the new food and the new culture and the new systems and the the way people did and the the near the language and and uh, the lights at night and uh, how things came alive at night and uh, it 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 was it was great. Uh, so we really enjoyed going to Hong Kong. And then we arrived in Taipei, and immediately my work started. Uh, we had to be accommodated in a hotel to start with because our furniture hadn't arrived yet. Our container, not our furniture, our container with all our belongings. We took very little furniture over because we were given a, a furnished uh, residence. Um, but we stayed in a hotel for a, a brief while and then we moved into our, our, our residence, uh, the official residence. We only really moved in when, when uh, my predecessor, uh, Colonel Trevor Mayer, uh, who was from the intelligence organization? Um, so I didn't I didn't know him before I got to Taiwan, um, but he he, uh, he when he moved out of the, the residence and moved into a hotel, then we moved into the residence and just waited for our stuff to arrive. Um, it was a very nice residence, a nice big house, very comfortable, um, well furnished with. Uh, beautiful furniture and a big swimming pool. And it was a really nice up on a mountain called Yang Ming Shan, uh, which is just outside of, uh, or it's on the, the edge of, of the city of Taipei. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very hot, humid climate. So it's nice to be in a place that is right up on the mountain where you get a bit of cool air. And uh, it was it was, it was was very pleasant. Uh, it's in a quiet area, a little streets that you had to go through to reach it and little alleys and so on but but very quiet area and there were nice places you could walk and 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 open areas as well forest and so on nearby so it was a very nice place to go to um and he hadn't arranged an induction program for me um and for the next month uh I had to attend functions and I had to go to meetings and I had to meet the uh, the chief of the general staff of the, the armed forces and uh, the guy from the army and the navy and the air force and what they com called the uh, combined operations, which was the sort of the organization that supported all the the defense force elements, the, uh, the army, navy and uh, and Air Force, um, you know, a lot of the logistics stuff was common. So they had this big organization that, that uh, the combined forces uh, that, that supported the whole thing. They also had a whole uh, reserve force, which was almost run as a separate arm of service. Um, and the the uh, veterans assistance uh, organization, the VACAs, to meet the people there. And, um, and, and you know, at, at every level that I had to work, there were the rounds of... of um, of dinners that I had to attend, um, and and the, the the Chinese got a very formal way of doing almost everything. Um, in many ways, even more formal than what we'd experienced when we were with the, the Spaniards. Uh, the the um, the dinner, for instance, when you held a, a Chinese function, a dinner that you went to, it started at six o'clock. And you had to be there at six o'clock. That's that's when you were welcomed at the door by the host, and you went and sat at your table. They only use round tables in Taiwan, so you're always sitting with a, uh, a circle of people uh, at the t at the table. There's no square sort of table where you're looking directly at only one person, and <clears throat> you're looking at everybody in a table. I, I thought it was a very good system. So much so that when we got back to South Africa, my wife ordered a beautifully built round table that we have in our dining room. We just found it's far more sociable to sit at a round table than to sit at a, at a square or an, uh, an oblong table, a rectangular table. So um, the, you arrive at six o'clock, you're welcomed and you go and sit down and I start the dinner. They have about 14 courses during the, the, <laughs> the dinner. But they're all little plates with little, and they come and they put something down and you dish up as much as you want. And it, it took me a little while to realize that, you know, 
there are going to be more courses. Don't eat too much in this first one because, you know, I'd fill my bowl and think to myself, yeah, these little bowls that they give us, you know, I better fill it as much as I can, otherwise I'm going to go hungry tonight. And, and, and next thing is they'd come and take the bowl away and the next one would come and, and then the next one and, and the next one. So, you know, it was all these different courses that would be placed in front of you. And I, we, we, we soon learned that you just take a few things with your chopsticks and put them in your plate and then you eat them and then you wait because there's more coming and there's more and there's more. And so, so it goes on. And a, a great social evening it's, it's had <clears throat> at eight o'clock. The host stands up and he goes to the door. Dinner's over. Everybody gets up and they all file off to the door. And as you come to the door, the host has got a, some aides standing nearby who hand him a beautiful package, these carrier bags, beautifully ornate things. And he hands a gift to every guest as you, as you leave. Shakes your hand, hands you the gift, and off you go and you go home. So there was no late nights for us in the social calendar. Six o'clock to eight o'clock. Eight o'clock is finished. Then you go home. That was great. I, I loved that because I don't, I don't like so sitting around drinking and talking nonsense until the early hours of the morning. So I, I really enjoyed that. But there is a little rider to that. And that is that the, the, there is an unbelievable drinking culture in Taiwan. Now, they've got a, a drink there called Gao Liang. And Gao Liang is distilled from sorghum that is grown on, on the, the Penghu Islands, just off, uh, off the, the, the Taiwanese coast. And this Gao Liang is a, a really potent spirit, very high alcohol content. Of course, I made it very clear to them from the time I arrived that I don't, I don't drink alcohol. Um, but what they do at the table is the host sits there, and next to him, he has, the host will probably be a general. And then next to him, he'll have, on each side, he'll have a colonel. And next to the colonel, on each side there, he'll, there'll be two lieutenant colonels. And then maybe two majors. And, and, and then there's, there's you on the other side. And, uh, you know, if you've got a colonel, one or two guests with you, why would they, they sit around? And then um, the... Um, the host will, they, they come around and they fill up these little, little, little glasses of Gao Liang. They come and they fill that with a bottle for the bottle. The, the, the waiters come around and they fill each one's little glass. You know, I would cover mine with my hand and say, you know, Shui, water, please. Um, which I'll get onto that, but that wasn't, uh, wasn't greatly appreciated by the Chinese at all. But they, they would then, then fill everybody's little glass of Gao Liang. And then the, uh, the host would say, you know, wish you luck. And he drink and then you drink as well. And then as soon as you're finished, then you're expected to propose a little toast to him as well. And, you, and then everybody takes another drink, you see. And, and then the colonel next to him, will propose the toast to you. And then you've got to take another drink and then you've got to propose a toast to him and then you take an, and then the colonel on the other side starts. So they work through and by the time they've got down to the last uh, people, you drunk on about a bottle of this stuff already. And, and, and the general's only had one little glass, you know, and he's smiling. And, and they deliberately try to drink you under the table in those two hours while you're struggling to eat the next course and, and you're answering another toast and drinking another one. And I think it's hilarious if, you, if you're absolutely blotter by the time you have to stagger out and get your gift and go, and go home. Um, of course, that never happened with me. And, and they were very disappointed. Uh, they were, were quite unhappy about the fact that I, and, and they said to me, but you can't, you can't toast a person with water. It's an insult to toast a person with water. Now, in our culture, if you can't, if you don't drink, then you take water and you, you know, you uh, toast the man with water. But the, that's that's water's an insult. So I said, well, you know, haven't you got some grape juice for me? So they said, yeah, they'll see what they can do. And they came, but they never ever understood grape juice. Every time I asked for grape juice, they gave me grapefruit juice. 
<laughs> so I got used to toasting people with, with bitter grapefruit juice every time because they didn't understand grape juice. <laughs> so it was it, it it was quite interesting. You know, I, I was learning a, a lot about the Chinese in those those uh, that month and all the, the functions that I had to had to attend. And interestingly, after the my predecessor had left and now I'm I'm on my own in the office and now I've got to run things. I was going through the documents and signing the coffers, and lo and behold, in the office, I find in one of the files, I find a report that one of my predecessors, not the one who was there just before me, but one of the previous ones, that predecessor had written a report on what the requirements are for an armed forces attache in Taiwan. These are the characteristics that he must have. Top of the list, he must play golf, and he must be able to take his drink, handle his drink. And I looked at this and I thought to myself, I don't play golf and I don't drink alcohol. So why do they send me to Taiwan? You know, <laughs> but it just shows you how they, they, they ignore the stuff that the person on the ground tells them, uh, but they have their own ideas and they'll send, they will send who they want to send for whatever reasons they have. Um, so uh, it, it just annoyed me when I saw that. It was amusing, but it, 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 it did annoy me because it showed me that they don't, they don't listen to what the military attaché tells them. Now, the, the head of intelligence in the military was a General Huang. He was an Air Force general. Uh, very, very intelligent man. Um, obviously highly competent. Um, he was a, a, a fighter pilot. Um, but he was in charge of the intelligence section. So I dealt mainly, the most senior officer that I dealt with most of the time was General Huang. And, and I would always have to go work through him for anything else. And any request that I had to visit any place or go to any institution, I would have to submit that to his office and then he would make the necessary arrangements and, and, and approve it or, or, or tell me, no, it's not possible. Um, General Huang, was a past master of the drinking culture in Taiwan. He, uh, he, he used to revel in, in driving his guests under the table at, at a dinner. And uh, the first dinner I went to with him, I said to, to him, General, I, I don't drink any alcohol. He said to me, you, you've got to drink alcohol. I said, no, sir, I, I don't drink alcohol. So he said to me, I'll get you to drink alcohol. I said, no, sir, you won't. So he said, we'll see about that. He said, before you leave Taiwan, I'll have you drinking alcohol. So I said to him, General, with due respect, sir, better men than you have tried that with me, and they never got it right. So he looked at me as if to say, he spoke English very well, this, this, this general. He looked at me as if to say, who, who do you think you are saying something like that to me? But he said, we'll see. And after I'd been there, I don't know, maybe six months or so, because every so often I'd have to attend another dinner with, with General Hong. Um, he said to me, look, you're making it very difficult for me because you don't want to drink any alcohol. I'll make a deal with you. I'll show you something that I'm going to do. It's got nothing to do with alcohol. And if you do the same, then we'll call it quits. I won't, I won't try and force you to drink alcohol again. I said, sir, that sounds like a, that sounds like a good deal, uh, as long as it's not something that's uh, ethically unacceptable to me. He said, no, no. He said, it's not a problem. So he calls one of the waiters. He says to the waiter, bring me a plate with two raw eggs on it. So they go into the kitchen and they come back and they bring him a plate with two raw eggs on it. They put some down in front of him. He says to me, no. He says, I want to tell you, I hate eggs. I can't stand eggs. But now, watch what I'm going to do. He picks up one of the eggs, he puts it in his mouth. 
and he bites it and he starts chewing and he chews and he chews and he chews until all the eggshells are fine and he swallows everything and he looks at me and he picks up the plate and he passes it to the colonel next to him and it goes around and comes to me and they put the plate down in front of me and he says to me your turn so I thought to myself, well, I, um, I can hardly say I'm not going to eat an egg now. So I picked up the egg and put it in my mouth and I bit it. And I chewed and I chewed and I chewed until I couldn't feel anything hard in my mouth anymore. And I swallowed. And he sat and he watched me the whole time. I'm quite sure that I didn't slip the egg into my collar or something like that, you know. He watched me very carefully the whole time. And when I was finished, he said, okay, Colonel, I won't bother you again. <laughs> and he never did. He never asked me to, to drink again. That was fine. <laughs> so, um, the, the situation in the embassy, and um, a, a military attaché anywhere in the world, um, certainly from South Africa, they, in those days, you had to have a, a top secret clearance. So I had to go through in the year before I was sent, I'd had to go through the whole process of being screened and checked and double checked and uh, people interviewing uh, references and, and, and so on. And I was given a, 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 a top secret security clearance. My wife was also screened and she was given a secret security clearance. So I had the, the highest level of uh, security clearance, and she had the second highest level. Um, my job at the embassy, besides um, the feedback I had to give back to, to uh, the South African National Defense Force, uh, anything that I found of any importance for, for the chief of the National Defense Force to know about, besides that, I also had to advise the ambassador to Taiwan on any military matters. Um, I found myself when I moved into the, the, the office in Taiwan, of my offices in the, in the embassy, I found myself with a whole lot of empty offices. And, uh, you know, the reason for that was at one stage we'd had such a close military relationship with Taiwan that when the embassy had occupied those offices, uh, they had allocated sufficient officers for three military attaches. So you had your, your, your overall uh, attache, and then under him you had two others. The overall one, if he was an army man, and then that he'd have an Air Force guy and a, and a, a naval guy under him. Uh, if, if he was, a, in fact, I think they were all uh, army attaches up till then. So they had a, a, a more junior lieutenant colonel as, a, as a, an assistant attaché, uh, an attaché for air and an attaché for navy. And, and he then dealt with the military, with the army, but he, he also was the overall boss of the office. And then there was a, a military assistant who was a South African NCO. Uh, who's administratively trained, and he handled all the, uh, and he was uh, given a top secret security clearance, and he handled all the, the, uh, the classified stuff, uh, administration and the classified messages and so on, and he had his own office as well. Uh, and then there were two Chinese uh, staff members, the secretary, the, the attache secretary. Um, uh, her name was Carol Lee. And she was an exceptional secretary. She was really highly competent, very, very good. Uh, she spoke English absolutely fluently. Um, and she knew every person in the military, in the, the Taiwanese military. She knew their officers. She knew their assistants. She knew their secretaries. She knew if I wanted to have anything, I would just go to her and say, Carol, I need, I need to do sort out something with the Navy. Um, 
who will I need to contact to do? And she will say, it's not a problem. And she'd get out there listening. She'd say, this is the man, this is it. And I'd say, okay, phone, let me let me speak to the person. And she'd say, this one can speak English. This one speaks no English. She's got a little bit of English. And so she knew everything about all of those guys. She was, she was, a, she was an incredible uh, secretary, uh, probably the best secretary I've ever had in, in, my, in my life, in my whole military career. She was just phenomenal. Um, and then I had a driver. Jimmy Chung. Now, um, I've I'd never had a driver in my life before. I, I always drive, drive myself. Um, you know, in South Africa these days, if you're promoted to a general, then the first thing you do is you, two things. You, you've got to have a, a, a very expensive laptop that the state must give you. Uh, you've got to have a very expense, expensive motor car to drive around, and you've got to have a driver. And uh, he, he must be at least a sergeant, uh, preferably more senior than that. And you, you, don't, you don't sit in the front seat. You sit in the back seat and look important. And, and you, the driver takes you every... No, I've, I've never had a driver. Never. And not, not, not before I went to Taiwan and not after I came back. And afterwards, when I was eventually promoted to general, I never used a driver. It was, to me, it was a lot of nonsense. Um, but, but in Taiwan, I quickly realized it was essential to have a driver. Because the traffic in Taipei is unbelievable, and it, it never stops. It goes on right through the night. It's, there, there are always traffic jams in Taiwan, in Taipei. And, and you know, I found that sometimes for a dinner, it, would, it could take you up to, up to three hours to drive from one part of Taipei, the city, to the other part because of the traffic. And then you'd get there and you'd have a two hour dinner and then another three hours driving back on, on, uh, to, to, to the other where you'd come from. So eight hours just for a dinner that's only two, 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 two hours. You know, that, that's the sort of situation. You, you just cannot believe uh, the, the traffic congestion that they had in Taiwan. Now, now, apparently there are two models that are followed in, in, in Asia. Uh, the one is the Singapore model, and the other one is the Taiwan model. The Taiwan model, uh, as, as people, as the traffic increases, as the people get more and more traffic, more and more vehicles, and the traffic increases, so you've got to build your infrastructure to accommodate the traffic. And, and your infrastructure never keeps up because you're just getting more and more and more vehicles on the road. So you, you never keep up with it. So it's a constant problem. Of course, the drivers in Taiwan are extremely considerate. Uh, they say tra traffic is like water. It just flows. You mustn't oppose it. You mustn't be difficult. So, uh, you know, if, if a guy comes from a side street and you're moving forward and he comes, he looks at you, he'll just smile at you and wave, and, and you just let him slip in in front of you, and nobody gets uptight, and you don't, you don't get road rage and sort of things like that. People just accept the road, traffic. It takes an awful long time, but it, it keeps moving. So, you know, that's the Taiwan model, the model. The Singapore model is you don't build your infrastructure to accommodate your traffic the way that they do in, in Taiwan. You limit your traffic to fit the infrastructure. So in, in, in Singapore, they only allow so many vehicles on the road. That's it. And if you want to buy a car and they've got the, all the vehicles that they allow, you can't buy a car. You put your name down on a list. And, and eventually it gets to your list, your name on the list. And, and there, because now so, so many cars have been withdrawn, so you can now buy a car and you can go onto the, the, the road. But of course, it's, it's, it's not a problem. Because in Singapore, they've got such an incredible commuter system, such a, a public transport system that you can get anywhere in Singapore whenever you like. I mean, you're the longest you have to wait for a bus or a, a metro train is about two or three minutes, and the next one is there, and you get onto it, and it takes you to where you go. And so you don't really need a car in Singapore, but it's a different way of doing it. In Taiwan, they, they, they don't limit your, if you want to buy a car, you buy a car. Um, but it just means that you got to put up with the traffic. So that I, that is one of the things I had to I had to get used to. Um, and the in line with that it comes the parking. 
there just is no parking. If I was to say to Jimmy, all right, I don't need a driver. You can go home. I'll drive. And and now I've got an appointment at the Ministry of National Defence, and I go through there. There's no parking. There's no parking. So what am I? I I'm I'm going to be late for my appointment. I probably won't be able to attend my appointment. So Jimmy drives me there. I get out and I go for my appointment. And Jimmy drives around the block <laughs> until I come up, come out, and I and I I call him and then, and then he, he picks me up. So you know it. The, the the secretary and the driver were essential in Taipei, and they were both exceptional. Uh, Jimmy knew every street in Taiwan and Taipei, and he knew all the back roads on the island. And if I had to go anywhere else on the island, he would drive me there, and he would take. And I'd say to him, Jimmy, I want to get to do a bit of sightseeing on the way. I went, and he'd say, No problem, Colonel, and he'd take me wherever I want to go. Um, at, 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 we'd we'd stay over somewhere, and I'd say to him, I don't want to stay in the city. I want to stay in a little little country town and say no problem and he'd take me there and take me to a guest house and i'd say no uh, you find a place where i can eat local food and and then he'd take me to a little restaurant and we'd sit there and and he'd help me to order the stuff and so on. so it was it was marvelous to have uh, someone like jimmy uh, to 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 take me around um and used to come into my office once a week and she would do my classified typing and my uh, uh, classified filing. Uh, I, I, uh, I was not particularly computer literate at that stage. Um, and, and I really didn't enjoy uh, typing letters and so on. Uh, Anne was a, 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 a professional uh, copy and dictaphone typist. So I would either just record something on a little tape recorder and, and she would type my letter from that. Or, or I would write it out in longhand and give it to her, and she would she would do that. Um, anything that was classified, anything that I've considered to be secret, or any stuff that I received that was secret, she handled all of that sort of stuff for me. So that is very useful. Uh, of course, she she uh, she didn't get any remuneration for that, but that that uh, wasn't a problem. But uh, you know, it, that's that she did that quite happily. Um, I had very little to do with the other staff in the embassy. I was I tended to be left largely to myself. Every now and then, the the ambassador would call a meeting, and we'd all go and attend the meeting. You know, all the other attaches, the economic attaché and the political attaché, and all the other guys. And we'd attend a meeting, but it wasn't very often, and it wasn't didn't last very long. And uh, so I, I tended to just do my thing. I was my own boss, and I was left to myself. I'd submit a report every month to DFR in Pretoria giving them an outline of exactly what I'd done. And, and for the rest, I, I just carried on by myself. And, and, and that suited me. That's uh, the way I prefer to work. Christine, our youngest daughter, was sent to the Taipei American School. Um, so she did all her schooling in English, although she did learn a bit of Chinese there as well. Very good school, excellent standard, uh, fantastic facilities, very expensive. But I only had to pay 10% of the school fees. Uh, the state covered the other 90%, which was which was absolutely marvelous. And when we'd been in Spain, the same thing had applied. And they went to the uh, uh, the American School of Madrid, my two older, older, sister, uh, older daughters. And they, um, so all my children ended up with two years at an American school um, where they got very good education and wonderful teachers and, and uh, fantastic facilities at their, at their disposal. So that, that was really good. I had a lot of official visits from people in South Africa, from military people coming to South Africa, because the, the Taiwanese were, were now really wooing South Africa and, and, and wooing the, the uh, military and the, and the government. So they were pumping money into South Africa, and they were inviting as many visitors as they could to, to Taiwan to attend the uh, to, to, to go on a, on a tour and show so they could show them what Taiwan's got and, and what Taiwan's prepared to, to, to do for South Africa. And uh, uh, the first official visit that I had took place about a week after my predecessor had left. Um, so I, I had to very quickly fit into to what was going on. And, and that was by the Chief of Staff Intelligence in South Africa at that, that time was uh, uh, Lieutenant General Dirk Verbeek. He and his wife came out. 
and spent about a week or 10 days there. Theoretically, he was my boss as the chief of staff intelligence. Um, but in actual fact, I never really dealt with him uh, or, or very little. Um, but he was out there and um, my predecessor had gone. Now I had to accompany him and Anne had to accompany his wife. And, and uh, we had to go around with them for all the different visits that were arranged by the Taiwanese. And uh, it was actually a, a, an excellent experience for me because I was taken to all the important places that they wanted to show him. And I was given my first exposure to them. Um, and it was my first visit to the island of Kinmen um, and, and of numerous other units as well. Uh, but the island of Kinmen was right on the edge of the main mainland China. I mean, as I said earlier, you can actually see what's going on on the, on the mainland from, from Kinmen. And, and Kinmen was a fortress. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. They had tunneled out the inside of a mountain on the island and there were tunnels all over the island and, and uh, there were gun emplacements and there were uh, barricades on the, on the beaches to stop any amphibious landings and, and, and uh, obstacles to prevent airborne landings. And it, it, it was uh, absolutely amazing to see uh, the defensive setup that they had on Kinmen. Uh, it was my first visit, and there, I, I can't remember how many times I went there. Other visits, um, pro probably five or six times. So uh, it was it was an eye opener for me, and it was very very useful. When our container arrived, uh, we were living in our official re residence on Yangmin Shan already, but um, uh, it uh, it was a bit bare, and we had very little of our stuff there because I only had what we could bring with us on the plane. Um, but when our container arrived, we could pack out our other stuff and I could pack all my books out into the study and, you know, I could start feeling at home again. Um, but we'd barely moved in when the ambassador informed us that he's been uh, told that uh, the cost of the residence that we're using is too high and uh, we have to start looking for a new residence. So I had to start looking around for another house that's going to cost me less or cost the, 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 the state less. <clears throat> I was sorry about that because it was a really nice place we were staying in, but uh, it's one of those things. It, in, in, in fact, uh, when the hostage taking took place, um, the, the house we were in was particularly vulnerable. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we were taken hostage. It, I, it's highly unlikely that it would ever have happened in the first, first house that we were in. Um, we also linked up with a, a church as soon as we got to Taipei. Um, it was always our practice in all our moves. We always tried to link up with the church as quickly as we could so that we, we, we found that as a very good way of settling into a community. Um, and we found a church, Calvary Baptist Church. It was a, 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 an American Southern Baptist church. It was uh, staffed by a pastor who was a missionary uh, to Taiwan. Um, and uh, it had a, it was an English language church, and it had quite a big expat uh, membership. A lot of people who, who were expatriates from countries like Australia and New Zealand and uh, South Africa itself and, and the UK and, and Canada, um, uh, all those sort of countries had people that, that tended to attend the, the English language church. And, and we also had people from other European countries like Austria and, uh, and so on. Um, and there were, there were a number of, of Chinese uh, who just opted to go to an English language uh, church. So we became very active members of Calvary, um, and we got to know a lot of really nice people, particularly uh, amongst the, the, the Chinese members, uh, and then uh, a number of others as, as, as well. Um, I met there a, a South African. Um, and developed a, a good friendship with him. We're still in contact with him and his, his family. Um, his name was Chris Dippenar. Uh, he was an Enchia Duomini. And uh, he'd become a missionary, and he'd been in Taiwan for about 10 years. He'd married a Swiss girl, and um, Johanna. And they, um, she was also a missionary. And they had uh, two daughters uh, who are growing up now. And I think, 
I think they're also missionaries. I'm not sure, but they were very, a very missionary orientated family. And um, Chris was um, <clears throat> he was a, a professor at the Taipei Theological Seminary, which was a Presbyterian seminary, beautiful place in up on Yangminshan, <clears throat> beautiful campus. But now. Chris was one of those people who had an, an unbelievable affinity for languages. Um, he obviously spoke English and Afrikaans. Afrikaans was his home language. Um, but he, he's, um, when he was called up for his national service, um, he was sent up to Uvomboland and spent most of his uh, service up there. <clears throat> and while he was in Uvomboland, he also learnt uh, Kwanyama, and uh, he used to go out whenever he could. He was a, a national service chaplain up there, but whenever he got the opportunity, he would also preach at uh, Vombu uh, uh, congregations, and he would preach to them in Kwanyama because he learnt the language. Um, he, he, he had studied both Greek and Hebrew at um, at the, the uh, Theological Seminary in Stellenbosch. And um, also while he was in doing his national service, he became a little bit bored because there wasn't a lot going on for a chaplain. Um, so he began to study Russian and, 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 and he mastered Russian as well. And when he got to Taiwan, Taiwan, the official language is Mandarin, which he studied and he mastered. Uh, but there is also a, the, the, the locals speak a dialect, which is Taiwanese, which is different from Mandarin. And he also learned to speak Taiwanese, so he could converse with anybody in, in, in Taiwan. Now, he was just amazing. I think, I think he mastered something like nine different languages, and he could literally, he could speak with them. He, he used to... At the, at the theological seminary, he would lecture the students in Chinese, in Mandarin. He would give the lectures in Mandarin to the Chinese students, teaching them Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> so, you know, he, he, he was amazing. His, his, his language ability was just, just phenomenal. And, and, and what a wonderful guy he was. And, he, they, you know, they just opted to go along to the English language uh, Calvary Church, and so their their children were brought up. Uh, Johanna, I think Joh Johanna's home language was German, Swiss German, um, but she also spoke Italian, and uh, they wanted to bring their kids up, you know, spe speaking as many languages as possible. Um, so they, they they really did. I mean, what what an amazing family! But uh, they they were really very special people. I became very good friends with the pastor of the Calvary uh, International Baptist Church, um, Bill, uh, uh, Bill Martin, a very nice fellow, and former United States Air Force vet who'd served in Vietnam and so on. Uh, so I, I had a lot in common with him. Um, most mornings, most Saturday mornings, uh, several of us, the men from the church, would meet for a men's bre breakfast in a, in a little uh, coffee bar, restaurant type of thing in the area known as Tianmu, which was quite a nice uh, uh, sort of uh, suburb. And um, those, those I have very memorable times, that the wonderful memories I have of the fellowship that we enjoyed during those men's breakfasts uh, and uh, the, the, the people that I became friendly with. So it was wonderful to have that, um, that circle of people that we were part of. Uh, when I arrived, I was informed by my predecessor that uh, you must join the American, uh, the American Club of Taiwan. And I, I couldn't understand why I must join an American club. But he said, no, they've got wonderful facilities there. You can go for meals there. It costs you very little to go for meals. And, and uh, they've got all sorts of sporting facilities. And if you want to entertain, you can, you know, hire their restaurants there. And they've got, the, it's really magnificent. Any sports you want to play, you know, golf or volleyball or anything else. Um, so, yeah, you could get all sorts of things. They're very 
very reasonable price and so on. But the membership fees were horrendous. It was a very expensive. But it was a great status thing. Um, the the Chinese loved being invited there and being you know, treated to something at the American club and so on. Because the, the Taiwanese Chinese are, are all very pro-American and I think anything American is wonderful. So um, you can really, you know, twist their arms by taking them along to the American American club in Taiwan. But I have to say that I, in the, my second year there, I dropped by our membership. I, say, I said to Anne, we don't use it enough. Uh, in the second year, there was even less chance of entertainment and so on. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it, 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 it was just very expensive to maintain. And, and quite honestly, it, it wasn't really my style, that sort of thing. So, so with some regrets, I, I, I stopped uh, my membership as a, as a member of the American Club of Taiwan. Then there was a very interesting thing that took place in, in, um, in Taiwan at around about the time, you know, just, just after we'd, we'd taken over there. In, in March 1996, and I arrived there in January. In March, there was a, an election, the first ever presidential election. It was the first such democratic election in, in 5,000 years of Chinese history and culture, the very first one ever to be held. Um, and so the president was duly elected by popular vote. Um, the Chinese on the mainland, the communists, were livid that this election was going to be held. They were so angry. Of course, it, it increased Taiwan's status in the eyes of the Western world that they were going to doing, doing something so democratic now, whereas Chiang Kai-shek had long ago died. Uh, and, and, you know, the... the, the Nationalists, the Kuomintang, they continued to, to, to be in power, but now they had to fight an actual election. And they won the election, but there were opposition parties that were now permitted and they could fight the election and the opposition parties did fairly well. And, you know, some of the opposition parties said, we've got to, we've got to stop saying that we're part of China. We've got to say that we're now Taiwan, we're a separate country and let China go away and we'll go our way. Of course, China won't hear of that. They, mainland China, they insist that, Taiwan is just a province of China, and they have to be incorporated back into, into mainland China. Um, but because the Chinese were so annoyed about what the, this election that was taking place, they tried to intimidate the, the Taiwanese into not voting, staying away. And, uh, and they did this by holding huge maneuvers on the coast closest to Taiwan, huge military maneuvers. It was just a threatening action. And then firing missiles, inert missiles over Taiwan, into the water on the other side, into the sea. So these missiles were now being fired, and, and uh, it was becoming a crisis, you know, it was becoming an international crisis. So the, the, um, the United States sent two carrier groups to the Taiwanese Straits just to warn mainland China, don't, 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 you, don't you think you can carry out something now? Now, I don't know, you know, most people won't understand what uh, a U.S. carrier group consists of. But I, I tell you that that's, the U.S. carrier group is bigger than most countries' whole armed forces because carried on those carrier groups, besides the battleships and the submarines and the cruisers and, and all the other stuff that goes along, they've, they've got these aircraft carriers with aircraft that are that will dwarf most most countries air forces um, they are they're jet fighters there are bombers there are, are uh, helicopters uh, there's everything you can think of and they carry a contingent of marines that uh, would be able to sort out the armies of most countries <laughs> the, 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 uh, uh, an American carrier group, is a complete combat capability, air, land, and sea, that, that we, we cannot even begin to comprehend the immensity of an organization like that. And they sent two of these carrier groups 
into the Taiwan Taiwanese Straits, and uh, so eventually the um, the the PRC had to stop their nonsense and stop firing missiles and stop uh, their maneuvers, and the elections went ahead, and the Taiwanese just laughed at them. They said, "We we not we not you're not going to stop us voting," and they all voted. Well, most of them. And and uh, well, they'd voted the nationalists back into power, but uh, the the fact is that they they were it was a free election that they anyone could vote for whoever they they chose. So that was an interesting experience, and and for me, what happened was uh, there was concern that if there was an invasion or if there were missiles thrash, fired at the, the island itself, that we would need to evacuate South Africans. Now these days there are so so many South Africans teaching English in Taiwan that um, you you uh, you'd never be able to get them all out of there. Uh, but in those days it, it, there were a few, but there weren't there that many. But um, I had to then draw up a contingency plan. Uh, I, did, I had to do an appreciation of the situation and then draw up a, a contingency plan for the evacuation of all the embassy staff and their families, and for as many other. South African citizens as we could get hold of and could bring to uh, Taipei and uh, we would need to fly them out. And so I had to liaise back in South Africa uh, with the, the, the Air Force in terms of support that they would be able to provide uh, with C-130 aircraft and so on. So that was a very interesting exercise. Nothing came of it, but it, it, it was a, a bit of a wake up for me as to just how Tense the situation uh, between Taiwan and and mainland China uh, was at that stage. We we uh, the fact that we had to move into a new house. We found a new house and we moved into it. Um, it was in an area where there are a lot of expatriates uh, living. Um, it was still an expensive house to to hire, but uh, it was. Um, uh, it was a lot less than the place we 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 would have had. Um, the place that we would have had had uh, fairly big grounds, and uh, it was only two stories. It had a ground store floor and a and a first floor. Um, uh, very spacious, big rooms, and so on. Um, the place that we now found was one of a whole row of houses that were built like most houses in Taiwan. They can only expand them upwards. So this one had five floors. Uh, it had on the ground floor at street level, it had a garage that you could drive in, a big garage that I could put two, three, four cars into if I if I had that many. Um, but that's what we had, in, and it had a servants' quarters uh, all on the ground court floor. And then you went up to the next floor where you had um, a small garden in front and a, a, a swimming pool, uh, but but very little space to uh, outside space. Uh, and there you had your your dining room and your lounge and your kitchen, uh, and then you went up another floor, and there was an, like an, a, a mezzanine floor where there was a, a a TV room with a balcony looking down onto the the lounge, and um, an office, uh, a, a study, which I filled with all my books and and so on, and and then you went up to the next floor was um, uh, bedrooms and bathroom. And then another floor also with bedrooms and bathroom, and then a sort of a, a, a roof balcony right on the top. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, a long, narrow house with lots of stairs going up. Um, and it was a row of houses that were all joined one to the other all the way along, and they were all identical. Uh, very nice place, a very nice, uh, comfortable house, um, spacious enough for, for us, uh, everything that we needed. Uh, but not quite as as private and um, and as sheltered as as and as secure as the as the place that we had been in before. But that's that's the way it went. Um, the fact that we had to downscale what I mean before they'd had to accommodate three military attaches and a military assistant, uh, provide housing for all of them. Um, now there was only one, and, and they felt that, that that house was too expensive. It was an indication of an, a reflection of how unimportant the post in Taiwan had become to the people back in South Africa. And increasingly, as I sat there and sent my reports in and tried to get a response from the people in 
at uh, Directorate Foreign Relations at TFR, I increasingly came to realize that they really couldn't give two hoots what happened in Taiwan. They were totally disinterested in it. It was no longer, no longer of any importance or priority to them. Um, so why they bothered to send me there, which was what my staff paper was all about, I don't know. But anyway, that's they, they were the ones who made those sort of decisions. Something about the weather and the environment in Taiwan. It's a tropical island. It's hot. Uh, it's humid. Uh, it's covered with mountains. People don't always realize that, but it's a very, very mountainous island. And the mountains are covered with forest, dense, dense, dense tropical forest. Uh, you, you almost can't get through the forest. Um, it's got spectacular gorges. It's got beautiful lakes and it's got a rugged coastline. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful island. Um, unfortunately, the coast is quite polluted because of all the people. Uh, there are very few places on Taiwan that are suitable for, for uh, human habitation uh, because it's just too steep. The mountains are just too steep and, and you can't really build on them. And they're covered with forests. So they look for the flat areas and the valleys and so on. And most of the flat areas, the level areas and the va valleys have got settlements in them. So they're very crowded. <coughs> so every populable area on Taiwan is dense, densely populated. Then one has to remember that <coughs> Taiwan is on the Pacific Rim of the, the, um, the so-called Rim of Fire. It stretches all the way down from the, the, the uh, west coast of, uh, of South America, uh, the west coast of, uh, of uh, North America, uh, going through Alaska and then coming down through Japan and, and Taiwan and then down to uh, the Southeast Asia. Uh, those areas are, are not only volcanic, but they're earthquake prone. So that's why it's referred to as the Rim of Fire. Earthquake, earthquakes were a, a, a frequent occurrence on Taiwan. Uh, the buildings are all constructed to withstand them. So the buildings, when there's an earthquake, the buildings actually move and they sway. Um, and the, the uh, South African embassy was on the 13th floor of a building. So when there was an earthquake, uh, you could feel the whole building that you're in moving. And, uh, uh, you know, the first time that it happened, I remember Anne was in my office the first time that she experienced it. Um, and it started swaying, and she said, "You know, she sort of held it. She said, I, 'I'm, I'm, I'm feeling lightheaded. You know, I feel, I feel as if I'm be becoming dizzy.' And I just say to her, no, it's just an earthquake. Just, just, just relax. You know, it'll pass. Uh, and, and you could look out of the window, and you could literally see the wind, the other, the other skyscrapers actually moving in there <laughs> as, a, and they were sort of built on on rollers, you know, to to be able to absorb these sort of shocks." Um, so this was this was quite an experience. It it was also Taiwan is also within the 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 Pacific typhoon belt. So when the typhoon season came along, you had these typhoons approaching, and and the, the, they could cause havoc. They could ca cause absolute unbelievable uh, damage with the winds and the and the rain and the, the torrential downpours. Uh, um, so they had a, a special uh, typhoon warning system, and you'd be issued with, with maps. Every household had, had maps of the, the direction from which the, uh, the, the uh, typhoon is moving and where Taiwan is and where the eye of the storm is and all the vicious areas around about. And there were sort of circles going out from, from Taipei City, uh, increasing circles. And as the typhoon reached each one of these circles, uh, they would issue a new alert. And for each alert, they had a list of things that you had to do in preparation, you know. And, and as the typhoon got closer, you'd have to tape up all your glass windows from the inside so that uh, if they shattered, they didn't, glass didn't shatter everywhere, you know, that it all, all collapsed inwards. You'd have to store water. Uh, you'd have to fill your bath with water because the water systems would be, be, be they'd just be, be stopped. They wouldn't function anymore. 
uh, you you had lamps all over that you'd have to plug in, and you know this it's it's it, it wasn't like the so-called uh, load shedding or the power failures from uh, from from ESCOM, which were scheduled. Uh, the typhoon could come up at any stage, so every household had had electric lamps that you charged. Uh, you left them on charge all the time, and so when a typhoon came and the electricity was cut, then you'd be able to pull these out and you'd have. Uh, you'd have lights for that sort of thing. And uh, when the typhoons did hit, it would shut down all activity. When you'd get to the, the closest circles to, to where, where, where Taipei is, then the alert warning would say, stay indoors. Schools would close, shops would close, traffic would cease. Uh, there'd be no movement outside of the houses. And then the winds would hit you. And when the winds came, you'd see trees whipping across the street, being blown across. You, the, the wind was, you, you cannot believe the strength of those winds. And, and then the rain would come. And, and, and it would be so, it's such a heavy downpour of rain that you literally, you, and I mean, the streets were not very wide. You couldn't see across the street. It would just be a solid sheet of water coming down. And, and the, 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 that would be for, a, you know, as it would pass through, a couple of days to pass through through the area. And when it left, when the typhoon had passed by and people were finally allowed out of their houses, uh, there would be devastation like you cannot believe. The uh, cars would be wrecked. Trees would be lying all over. over because most, most people in Taiwan don't have garages. Their cars are parked in the, in the, in the street. And, and there would be such shop signs would be all over. There would be doors and things blown over everywhere. It, it would just be an, a, a total mess. And... And for weeks afterwards, they'd be cleaning up the city and sort of replacing all the signs and the neon lights that had crashed down. And, and uh, you know, the, the, in the Asian cities, they're very fond of the bright lights at night and so on. And all of that would be ruined and they'd have to replace everything. So, uh, you know, you couldn't go to work. You couldn't go to school. You'd, you'd sit battered up inside your house and, and just hope that nothing blew down and, 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 and damaged and your windows weren't shattered and, so it 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 was it was quite terrifying uh, experiencing a typhoon, and then also what happened during the typhoon was because of all the rain you'd get mudslides, and you'd often have areas where there are, are, are buildings, sometimes fairly high residential buildings, blocks of flats and things. Uh, the mountainside would just slide down, and the the building would be knocked over and just be covered with mud, and uh, and so, sometimes a whole village would just vanish. Under under the mud, so it was it was quite terrifying. It was the 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 natural disasters in a little island like Taiwan. They were geared to handle them, but uh, but it was very difficult anyway. Now uh, my the visit from uh, Dirk Verbeek uh, was the first of many. There were many other visitors, um, and and some of them were quite high, high profile visitors. For instance, the the Minister of Defence, Joe Mudise, at that stage. He and his wife, uh, Jackie Sadiba, they came out and uh, they, they uh, spent a, a time there. And, uh, you know, I could tell you lots of interesting and funny stories about those sort of visits as well, uh, but there's no time for that at this stage. But, um, uh, you know, I remember the uh, Anne found it uh, quite, quite funny. The minister, the m ambassador that we had there, he and his wife were very... You know, they were professional diplomats and everything had to be done according to the right protocol and so on. And uh, the minister and his wife had, had barely arrived, you know. And, uh, of course, I addressed, addressed him as, as sir and her as ma'am. And um, uh, I said to Anne, you better do the same. And, and so she did. And the first time she spoke to the, the uh, minister's wife, who happened to be a brigadier in the SANDF as well. She she was an ex MK woman and she'd been appointed as a brigadier in the. But she weren't wasn't coming in her capacity as a as a military officer. She was just coming as a minister's wife. And uh, the first time Anne said to something to her and addressed her as ma'am, she said to me, "Don't don't don't call me that. Just call me Jackie." So um, so that's what Anne did. And uh, then at, at some function where the, the ambassador was also there, with me, then he, his wife called Anne aside and said to her, you, you, you can't call the minister's wife by her first name. Uh, don't you understand that? 
you know, she's a brigadier in her own right. Uh, uh, you must either call her brigadier or, or, or address her as, as, as Mrs. Medice. You, 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 don't, you don't call her Jackie. So, you know, and, and said, she said, I must call her Jackie. She said, that doesn't matter. You don't do that. Anyway. The, we, the, the, the ambassador and his wife weren't at any other functions after that and, and continued to call her Jackie. And both she and the minister were, and, and uh, both Anne and, and the minister's wife were more comfortable with that. So, you know, the protocol didn't, didn't matter. And, and interestingly enough, I uh, came across her several more times before she retired. And then much later when we were both retired and I joined the a reserve Force Council. Um, she was also serving on the Reserve Force Council, so I got to know her again quite well, and I found her to be a a, a very uh, uh, decent, polite, uh, understanding person. I uh, I got on very well with her. So, uh, you know, uh, that was that was quite a nice quite a nice visit. With we had some interesting uh, little side issues with his. Um, uh, he brought his driver along as well. And his driver, for so his driver was also now had been trained as a as a bodyguard. You see, so when they went through customs in South Africa, because it's the minister, he didn't go through the normal customs and so on. He just went through so. So this driver takes along his his nine millimeter pistol, and uh, it, so n- nobody saw that. So he gets on the aircraft and he go, and if they fly through to Hong Kong. So they're going at Hong Kong. They've got to change aircraft. You see, so they're going through the the, the various procedures at Hong Kong, and they, the Hong Kong guys pick up this 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 nine millimeter pistol. Boy, within seconds they had guys there with rifles trained on this guy, and this guy didn't. Look. So they took his pistol away from him, and there was a whole issue. And you know they sorted it out eventually, but they said to him, "No, you." You know, I, I don't know what happened, whether the pistol was returned to South Africa or, or whatever, but by the time he got to Taiwan, he didn't have his nine millimeter pistol any, anymore. So, and and so we, you know, we attend several of these meetings and so on uh, of the functions, and 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 the the this driver or uh, bodyguard now, he has to attend some of them as well. And on one one occasion, he says, he's speaking to Anne, and he says to him, "Wow," he says, "You know, I." I, uh, this is the driver now. He says, you know, I, 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 got, I think he was a, 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 a sergeant or something like that, you know, also an ex-MK guy. And um, and he says to Anne, um, I, I can't eat this food anymore, you know. You know, you know, I'm longing for some pop and flace. And, and so, so, you know, so we laughed anyway. So we go back uh, home and, and I've got another function that evening and uh, there's um, – uh, uh, it's a function that the, the the bodyguard is not going to go to. It's, uh, the minister and a few others, and so the bodyguard is going to stay at the hotel now. So, I mean, it, we, well, what bodyguarding can he do in Taiwan? In any case, in Taiwan, when there's a visitor there, they provide their own security for that sort of thing. But anyway, they, they, they're all new to this sort of thing, so they didn't understand these things, and they weren't properly briefed by our own people in South Africa before they left. I often wondered what our own people in South Africa did at all of these sort of things. Anyhow, they, they um, and so Anne goes home and uh, she says, um, we, now we've got to go to the function this evening. So she says, I'm going to make this guy something. So she she makes some pop and flace and she puts it into a plastic container and, and wraps it in a shopping bag and so on. And we go through to meet the minister now at the hotel. And uh, when uh, we let them know, she 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 says, ask if the bodyguard can come down. There's something she wants to show him. And so he comes down, you know, before the minister's even ready, and so on. Um, and and uh, she um, she says, I've got something for you, and she gives it to him. And he takes it, and he looks at it, and he says, he looks at her, and he says, I know what you put in here. And she says, do you? She says, he says, it's pop and flace, isn't it? So she says, yes, it is. She says, I'm not going to show this to the minister. And he goes off to his, <laughs> to his room to, to eat his pop and flace. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, then we, we also had a, a visit from the Deputy Minister of Defence, Ronnie Casseroles. 
and his wife, Eleanor. <clears throat> now, the, the, that was an interesting one because they, um, they uh, I, I, I get all the notifications and now I've got to do, make all the arrangements with in conjunction with the, the Taiwanese military and so on. And so they're discussing the program with me. So the guys say, you know, this is, this is a little difficult. We, we normally take a person to the, the tomb of Chiang Kai-shek, which is on a square right in the middle of Taipei. You know, it's a, it's a huge, old, big building, and it's got this massive statue of Chiang Kai-shek sitting in a, in a like, looks like a throne. And, and he looks down on them, and they've got guards there uh, 24 hours a day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a shrine, this uh, tomb of Chiang Kai-shek. And, and they say, normally, if we get an important visitor, we get them to, to, to lay a wreath at, the, at, the, at the, the tomb. But, you know, we don't want to cause any offense. And we know, we know that um, Ronnie Castles is actually a communist. Um, so we want to treat this. Well, what would you suggest we do? So I said to them, look, um, with, all, with all due respect, I think... Um, I, I think Ronnie Castles would understand this sort of thing. So I think it's it's important that you that you let him lay a, a, a wreath at the tomb of Chiang Kai-shek. I said, oh, are, you, are you sure? Are you sure he's not going to be offended by this? I said, no, don't worry. You go ahead and do it. Now, I was being a little bit facetious here. You know, I knew Ronnie Castles would not really appreciate having to lay it because, I mean, Chiang Kai-shek was probably the greatest anti-communist you could ever come across. And, and uh, Ronnie Castles was very aware of the Chinese Civil War and the role that Chiang Kai-shek played with the nationalists. And, and uh, he was a, an ardent supporter of Mao Zedong. And, and so, uh, you know, this, this, this was a little... Uh, so, so I said, no, 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 you know, he, he must do this. So along came... Uh, Ronnie Castles, and of course, when he arrives, I have to brief him and what's what's going to take place and so on. So I said to him, "So you 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 have to understand that now um, there's something on the, the 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 first day of the visit. We've got a we've got a a visit and a wreath that you've got to lay, uh, but you do have to understand that this is uh, this is very important from a diplomatic point of view. You don't you don't want to offend the the hosts over here, and I'm aware of your personal views on this." Uh, but the fact is that there has to be a, a, a wreath laid at the at the, the tomb of Chiang Kai-shek. So he says, "Well, do I do I have to do that?" So I said, "Yes, sir, I'm afraid you have to do that." Uh, so he says, "Well, isn't there some way we can get around that?" So I said, "No, sir, I'm sorry. This is uh, this is an absolute necessity. It, it, I think it's important that you do this." Um, so you know he wasn't too happy with that, but um, but he went ahead and he, he did it. So I I had a little feeling of satisfaction in my heart, and the, the day that we all came into the huge big mausoleum there where the tomb is, and and uh, he went to the foot of the the statue and and he laid the wreath and he had to stand back and put his hand on his chest and look up at Chiang Kai Shek and I thought was oh I wonder you communist I wonder what you're thinking now as you're doing that but <laughs> but anyway. I, we had a very good visit with uh, Ronnie Castles, and I um, and his, his 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 wife was a very pleasant person, and she got on well with Anne. And uh, uh, we, uh, I chatted with him, to him about a number of things, and um, uh, you know, uh, it's it, it'll come out later when I talk about the hostage taking. But um, the fact is that uh, uh, he was the the only person in the top echelons of government and even the defense force, who actually, he wrote me a letter after the hostage taking. And in the letter, he said to me, you and your family have been an outstanding example of what South Africans should do in a crisis. And uh, thank you for, uh, for your behavior and for the positive contribution to the status of our country and what you did. Uh, I really regret that you had to go through this, and it it was it was a really nice letter that I got from you, and I I I, I really appreciated that. So uh, you know, there, there we are. For despite our differences, um, there was a a degree of mutual respect there, which uh, which I think I, I I certainly appreciated. So yeah, that that was uh, Ronnie Castles. We also had the deputy chief of the SANDF. The, 
chief designate who, was, who would later take over from George Meiring. That was uh, Sipiwe Nyanda, Nyanda and his wife. Uh, they came out and we had to take them around. With each of these, we'd have to go to all these important places and we'd have to take them to Kinman Island and, and you know, uh, all, all of these things had to go take place. And then we had some others that were less spectacular sort of visits. We had a visit from uh, from Lieutenant General Philip Duprio, who was, I think he was Chief of Logstaff at that stage. Uh, he came out for a visit. Um, we had Brigadier Des Lynch from the Air Force, who was, I think, Director of in info information systems or something like that in the defense force. He also came out. We had the the commandant and the dean of the military academy, Brigadier Pit, Pit for Birk and uh, Colonel Chris Nelson, both of whom had been lecturers of mine when I was at the military academy. So it was quite nice to host them there. Um, we had retired Lieutenant General uh, Raymond Holtzhausen, who was uh, in charge of the Council of Military Veterans. He came out and held discussions with Vakas, the, the Taiwanese uh, veterans organization. So, you know, we had lots of those sort of visitors, which were uh, always interesting, always gave me an opportunity to visit uh, other places. And, you know, we went to uh, very important uh, establishments and so on. And, and, and it, was, it was very interesting for me. We had a few unofficial visitors, if I can call them that. I'd, I'd got to know uh, Simon Bainham, who was, um, he was with, uh, he was a, a, a commentator with the Institute of Strategic Studies, which is the organization that was founded and run by, by Yaki Salier. Um, and and uh, I knew Yaki Salier quite well, and I'd met Simon at Yaki's house, and they, you know, we'd had uh, uh, at a braai or something and, and chatted with them and, and uh, his wife, Nina, a very pleasant person. And they, they had left uh, the ISS, the Institute of Strategic Studies. They were British and they'd gone back to the UK because he felt that at that stage he'd been focusing on Africa and he wanted to change his focus to Asia. So he'd gone back there and now he was looking at Asia and he'd come on a visit to Taiwan. And when I heard that he was coming, it was nothing to do with us at the embassy or anything South African. But when I heard that they were coming, because I knew of that, that, that I got hold of them and, you know, we spent time with them. And uh, we took Nina to the night market at Sherlin and uh, showed her around a few things and so on. Um, and then there was, a, there was an international air traffic controllers conference. At, um, at in Taiwan, which was unusual to have something like that. In, in, usually they avoided having international conferences at Taiwan. But uh, this one was held there. And uh, also it had nothing to do with defense. It was a civilian air traffic controllers. But I, at that stage, I had the time and I had the uh, facilities available. So uh, I went and attended the conference um, and I met up with a South African delegation. And I said, look, let me, you've got a bit of time off. Let me show you around. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I did. I took them out and I took them and showed them the sites and various other places and so on. But they were such an ungrateful lot. You know, they, they really, they, they, they didn't show any appreciation of the effort that I went to to try and show them around. And then, you know, they were South Africans who were, uh, who from the old dispensation, and you would have expected that they would have, you know, just shown a little bit of appreciation, but they sort of, pulled their noses up and, and so on. So I thought, well, you know, if that's uh, your attitude, then, then go your way. Then a, a big thing, a big undertaking that the, uh, that the, the uh, Taiwan government uh, embarked on. We had established a thing called the Service Corps as part of the new National Defense Force, South African National Defense Force, headed by a Lieutenant General, and this service corps is now going to train people for vocational servicemen, uh, particularly the uh, you know the MK vets and so on who, who hadn't uh, had an opportunity to qualify for jobs and so on to train them for vocational uh, employment. And Taiwan got involved in this and said, "Look, we can help with this." And they got involved in two ways. The one they donated an incredible amount of machinery that was able, that the people would be able to use for the training of people in for vocational 
uh, directions. And then secondary, secondly, they offered to train instructors to train the people to use these things. Um, and, you know, it was technology, it was footwear, uh, it was in driving capabilities, uh, it was in uh, municipal uh, tasks and municipal jobs and that sort of, all very valuable sort of things that they offered to do this. And, and it was stuff that they had in place in Taiwan. They had incredible vocational training centers in Taiwan. So a whole delegation of people were sent out as instructors and they came and spent, I forget how long it was, maybe two months, maybe a bit more that they spent out there and at, at these vocational training centers. And, and I went along, there was the Institute of Technology, there was the Institute, the Municipal Vocational Training Center. There was a Youth Vocational Training Center. Um, there was a Footwear Research Institute. Um, a municipal drivers training center, uh, um, all sorts of other vocational training centers. And, and I went out and visited every one of these centers and visited the people while there, while they were undergoing the training. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, liaised with the, uh, the, the Taiwanese authorities that were doing it. And then at the end of the whole thing, the chief of the service corps, Lieutenant General Lambert Malloy, came out also an XMK man, he came out and, um, you know, took uh, delivery of, formally took delivery of the stuff they were sending to South Africa and, and the uh, qualification of all these people in the various things that they'd gone and a bit of a function for all of them and so on. And man, this guy, he, uh, I invited him to my home and, you know, let him, <clears throat> this guy was an out-and-out out Stalinist. He was a, a, a self-proclaimed Stalinist. That, that was his political viewpoint. And he sat there in my lounge and spent the time telling me just how wonderful the African culture is and how, how poor the Chinese culture is and the Western culture is in comparison to the to the African culture, and and all, all the time drinking my expensive whiskey, uh, which I uh, would normally reserve for very important people coming out there. But of course, when he came to the house, I said, would you like something to drink, sir? And he said, yes, have you got some whiskey? And I said, yeah. So he said, you know, I don't take anything less than Dimple Hague. Um, so I said, well, I can help you with some of that, sir. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, this guy, um, he, he was just an objectionable fellow. But, uh, but anyway, uh, the sadness of it was those guys all went back to South Africa. Um, the machinery arrived there. I was told by some of the guys afterwards the machinery was put into sort of uh, places where they would have worked from in the center that they were building, and it was left there to rust. It was never used. Uh, the people that had been trained at Taiwanese expense were never really employed as proper instructors, and the whole service corps just sort of disintegrated and, and never came to anything. So uh, it was again the question of implementation. The Chinese knew how to implement a thing. We had this whole thing that we'd set up, the whole structure for, and, so, and we weren't able to implement it. That's the that's the tragedy of South Africa. But anyway. It, you know, it was an attempt by the Taiwanese to say, we can contribute to your problem of unemployment, training the people, vocational training. We are prepared to support you in all sorts of, no, but they're not, they're not good enough because they're not communists. Uh, I can guarantee you the communist China hasn't offered anything like that to us. They haven't offered to do to solve our problems in this way. Okay, so as, as I say, one has to bear in mind that um, the, the Department of Foreign Relations of the SADF at that stage was still almost entirely run by, uh, by former SADF uh, personnel. So, you know, I really could not understand why the, the staff work was so, so poor. Uh, I, I had to send in a monthly report of what I'd been doing every month. Um, I never got feedback. I never got any response. 
I never had any indication. And there was an officer allocated there, who, who a colonel who was supposed to oversee what was taking place in uh, in in uh, in Taiwan. Uh, he had a couple of other countries as well, but 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 that's what he had. They, they only had about thirty countries where they had military attaches. So it wasn't as if it was a, a, a huge job to do, but but it and, and they had I, I suppose they must have had at least thirty people that they were was doing their work over there. But I don't know what work they were doing because they certainly didn't respond to anything that I did, um, unless I sent repeated requests. I could never get any response out of them. Uh, the visit reports that they had played such an, an important part during our attaché course that we must uh, really produce good visit reports. I sent in a visit report on every place that I visited. I they were they were ne never even acknowledged, and and I imagine they were just ignored because that's so. So what's the point? What's the point of doing that? They would send me stuff, budget stuff, that be, that would be incorrect. Be totally confusing. Sometimes they'd send the wrong one, one for another country to come to me. Uh, uh, when I would send them a request for authority to buy something that I needed, uh, because I'd have to get approval for the to to for anything that I spent money on that was outside of what was scheduled, um, it would just get lost. And you know, when I don't hear anything from them, I'd get no. They don't know what's happened to it. They they can't find it. You'll have to submit it again. So, you know, the, 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 the guy who was my contact person there, the, the, the colonel who was supposed to be my contact, I never heard from him. When I'd write to the person and say, listen, well, why don't, then he'd get very uptight because I'm saying you, 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 you're not reacting to me. You're, not, you're behaving as though I don't exist. Um, the director of foreign relations, I never heard from him. Never. He was a, he was a naval commodore, uh, which is the equivalent of a brigadier. I never heard a word from him. I, he, he, it was as if he, he didn't even know that I existed. Um, most of my letters and any other communication that I sent, uh, we had a closed email system, so we could send emails uh, that were completely secure. Um, uh, th those things that I'd sent were just ignored. Just ignored. They would then they would kind of jump on the bandwagon and suddenly give me a totally unrealistic deadline and say, "Oh, you've got to submit this stock taking report by by within three days." And I'd I'd write back to them as, "Listen, do you think I've got nothing to do here? I've got the, for the next three days I've got a full program. I'm doing things. I can't do stock taking now. If you want me to do stock taking, you give me warning. Tell me this month that you want me to do it next month, and I'll schedule it." Uh, no, then they get very uptight. No, you know, you you got to react when we want you to do something. You got to react. And I said, what about if I want you to do something? No, they, you know, it it was it was absolute. I've never had such poor support from an administrative point of view, and and from a control point of view, I've never had such poor support ever. So it was it was disillusioning for me, absolutely. Uh, um, when they'd send me correspondence, especially on on the classified email, it would lack dates. It wouldn't have a, a, a person's name who'd sent the thing to me. There'd be no file reference on it. Uh, the addresses of people that I've got to send stuff to wouldn't wouldn't appear on the on the on the, on the, on, the, on the email. Uh, they'd put no security classification on it. Um, it was everything that would be a DS nightmare. Any person who's a DS at the, one of the colleges who has to, particularly if you're doing the senior staff course. Uh, uh, a person who resents stuff like that, I'd kick them off the course. I'd say, you know, you're not fit to be a staff officer. Get out of here. But this is this is the stuff that uh, the trash that was dished up to me. It it, it was pathetic, really. It was uh, uh, my merit assessment. They didn't fill in my merit assessment. They sent me the merit assessment forms and said, fill in your own merit assessment. Now you know I've had previous commanders who've tried that trick on me as well. I mean that's that's a pathetic that's a that's an abdication of responsibility. That's all it is. Fill in your own merit assessment. I, I've never done that to people. I've never given a person the thing. You, I, I'm too lazy to do this. So uh, I don't feel like you. You fill in your own merit assessment, and I'll, I'll I'll sign it if I'm happy with what you say. So you know the the first year I did it, I never got any feedback. They didn't tell me what my merit assessment was. What so the second year I just refused to do it. So I didn't have a merit assessment for my second year. They said, you must fill in your, I said, I'm not filling in my own assessment. You're the people who must tell me how I'm doing. Don't expect me to do it. 
So I didn't have a merit assessment for my second year. Because I just said, I'm sorry, if you don't want to do it, I'm not doing it. That means I don't get a merit assessment. Yeah, but that could count against you. I said, well, fine, let it count against me. Um, you know, I, 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 they, they sent me a technical team to install new computers and printers and so on in, 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 in the office, which they brought, brought from South Africa. They didn't warn me that they were coming. Suddenly, I heard that the guys are in Taiwan and, and they're staying in a hotel and they want to come and, and, and fit all the new equipment into, in my office. So then I got to contact DFR and say, what's going on here? Oh, no, no, we've sent them out. So I said, well, thank you for letting me know they're coming. Thank you for warning me that the people are coming to do this. No, but they're there now. You must let them do that. So I let them into my office and I said, all right, you guys sort out this sort of stuff and, and, and I'll go and find something else to do. So they, they set everything up and then they went off somewhere to see the sites of Taiwan or something, or Taipei. I don't know what they went to do, but they, they then disappeared. So I was busy in my office and I went out to, to do something else. Next minute, there is an enormous explosion in my office. <laughs> I come into the office and the new computers and printer that they've got there are blown over and lying all over the place. It was something to do with the connection because the, the, the power supply is different in Taiwan to what it is in South Africa. Now, this so-called technical team, I mean, when I set up my radio or something, I, I make sure that I've got all of those sort of settings correct. These guys hadn't bothered to do that. And whatever it was that went wrong, I don't know. I don't understand the technicalities of these things. But there was an ex Fortunately, I wasn't in the office when this happened. But poor old Carol and Jimmy came running out of their offices. And they were, what's happening? What? <laughs> you know, they, they thought the mainland China had attacked us or something. <laughs> But, you know, it just shows you the level of, of absence of profession, professionalism uh, in, in the Directorate of Foreign Relations. It, I, I have never had to work for such a, in my whole military career, I mean, I've worked with some exceptional people and exceptional organizations and, and people who really were professional and knew what they were doing. But, but none of those people that I encounter at DFR, except for Sharon. She was the only one. So, uh, also, and you know, I, it sounds now as though I'm a real moaning mini, but, but my, my time in, in, uh, in Taiwan was not all negative. But I think it is important to point out because my time in the military generally uh, was not a negative experience. It was an extremely positive experience. I had a wonderful career and wonderful opportunities, and I did some great. But, but I, I learned that there was also a downside to the Defense Force. And, and to some aspects of, the, of defense when I was in, in Taiwan. Because I also had a, a very unhappy relationship with Armsco and Denel. Armsco and Denel were busy trying to market in, in uh, Taiwan. But they would arrive in Taiwan without any warning or any notification. And I, as the military attache, was responsible for, for making sure that... Um, the, 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 the proper connections were made between the Arms Corps and Danel people and the right people in the, the, the military in Taiwan because they had a different setup over there. And they didn't have a civilian organization that did this. It was worked through the military. And, and so it was in my province. And in any case, one of your responsibilities as a military attaché is to promote arms sales in the country, in your host country, by your own military uh, armament industry. So I was responsible to do that. But those guys would pitch up in Taiwan with no warning, nothing at all, no notification. They'd ignore me completely. And, and then they'd go and visit the people in the defense force that they want to. And I would know nothing about it. And the military, the, the, the Taiwanese military would assume that I know what is going on. And it led to some very embarrassing situations on, on, on occasion. And they got themselves into difficulties. And as soon as they get into difficulties, then they'd get hold of me and say, listen, we're over here and doing this, but something's not working over here. Can you help us to sort out this or the other? They'd cause themselves problems, and then they'd come to me for help. But, but I wasn't good enough to even notify that they were coming into the, into the country, into my domain, and trespassing on, on what is my, my job is to sort out the liaison, not theirs. Uh, and, and when I refused to tow their line or to run around after their agents, 
because they would send agents from South Africa over there to, to now liaise and to, to sort these things out and to make to do the negotiations and to get a good price and, and all the rest of it. And, 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 and when I refused to run around after those agents, because they expected me to do that, they thought I was a little uh, lapdog who, who was at their beck and call. Uh, and, and I refused to do that. Then they would get very uptight with me and, and accuse me of all sorts of things. They, they, they treated me as, they, as if I was there for their convenience. And, and, and that was not the case. I was there to facilitate whatever actions they wanted to carry out. I wasn't there for their, at their convenience to run around after them. Uh, they had massive budgets and they had uh, entertainment allowances and they uh, treated the Chinese to all sorts of things. Uh, <coughs> and, and, and I was excluded from all of that. I didn't even know that they were doing it. So I had to severely reprimand them. And I did. And I had to warn them that if they did not get into line, I'd terminate all future contact with them. And I'd warn the military authorities of the ROC not to deal with them in future. Yeah. Did they get annoyed with that? There was one guy, a big, hulking, bumptious and loudmouthed agent who, who was really a very offensive sort of person. He threatened to, to report me and he accused me of undermining the national interests of South Africa. So I said to him, listen, you want to report me? Please do so. Go ahead and do it. I would welcome it because that will give me the opportunity to explain to my authorities just what a bunch of yahoos you are. So I, I never heard another word from him or, or, or anything about it. But, uh, you know, the, the, those guys were, the, the, they were, they were unbelievable. They thought that they, they, they could call the tune. You know, they behaved as if they're paying my salary. They're not paying my salary. Anyway, those were, th th those were, those were some of the negative aspects. Uh, but, but, you know, fortunately, there were not that many. But the ones that there were, were used to get me really worked up. Um, I had to do a course to find out what my role was over there. These guys come over there. They've had no training in anything. All they want is money. They want to, they want to get a transaction. They want to sell stuff to these guys. So, and, and, and that's not the way I worked. So... Then I, I, I tried to improve my, my Mandarin. So I, I budgeted for, for money for lessons. And uh, I got a lady, Margaret Wren. She was very good. Uh, and she was a, a very patient woman and really worked hard on trying to. She used to come through to my office. I can't remember, maybe twice a week. And, uh, and, and she would uh, sort of face the ordeal of working with me for an hour or two. Uh, and giving me giving me Mandarin lessons, man, I struggled. And she used to try and push me into a corner. You know, she'd she'd teach me something about something specific, and then she'd say, "Now, you go out into the street, and you go and do the shopping and buy the stuff." And I said, "No, I've, I've only I haven't even." She said, "No, no, you go and do it now. Go out and do it." So then I'd realize, you know, she's now putting the pressure on me. So, and then I'd have to go out and, and then I'd have to go and speak to the guys in, in Mandarin because the guys on the street, they don't, you know, it's easy when you're working with the generals who speak English and so on, but, but now I'm on the street. These guys don't speak, they speak Mandarin and they speak Taiwanese. If you don't speak either of those, <laughs> you're lost. So I, I'd, I'd go out and try and uh, try and converse with them and ask them things and buy things and so on. Yeah, but it was a battle. And, and you know, and it wouldn't help to say, oh, well, look, I'm going to stop this now. I'm going to talk English because I don't understand English. So you've, you've got to just do it. So you've got to figure out a way of doing it. So she, she put a bit of pressure on me. And um, so she was, she was a lovely person, but she, uh, she, 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 did, uh, she did know how to, how to get me into line and, and get me to, 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 to work harder at it. But I have to admit, I, I, I never fully mastered the language. Well, I didn't come anywhere near to mastering it. I could, I could hold a, a very basic conversation. I could greet the person. I could comment on the weather. I could comment on the traffic. Uh, I could ask them how they were and how their families were. And, 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 and that was about it. And then I'd, I'd run out of vocabulary and my tones would start getting mixed up and, and, and they'd start looking at me blankly and wouldn't understand anything. So... Um, <laughs> I'd have to switch to English. So, <laughs> the, the, I, I, I had to submit reports on, on all my visits, as I said earlier, and I had a lot of visits. I went to a lot of places. They invited me to some, 
uh, but many I would request them. And some of them just in my normal day-to-day work, I would have to have contact with these people. Uh, I went on numerous occasions. I went to the Ministry of National Defense and had to have discussions with them there. Uh, Twice I had to go to the army headquarters and have discussions there because usually I didn't have to work with the services individually. I'd work with the the defense minister, ministry of defense itself. Uh, About four times I went to the naval headquarters. The naval guys were very, very keen on maintaining contact and, you know, I had a lot of contact with them. Uh, I went to the Air Force HQ at least three times where I had to uh, have discussions with the guys there. Uh, and, and then the combined services force, which was the logistic backup and so on, they seem to have a particular interest in, 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 in South Africa. So, you know, at least five occasions I was at their headquarters to discuss things. Of course, I went many more occasions to, to some of their subordinate units because I used to request opportunity to go to the units because that's where you find out what really happens. Otherwise, in the headquarters, you you know you're only hearing secondhand what they say. But if you go to the place itself, it, it, it makes a big difference. Um, they had a lot. They got a lot of colleges at the in Taiwan, and they're very very intense on education. And the officers are all highly educated, um, but they've got specialized colleges in in the defence setup. Uh, they've got an armed forces university, and 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 uh, that I was able to visit. Um, they, they've, uh, they've got a National Defense Management College, which I went to on several occasions. And then, then they've got the, the Fushing Gang College, which is a political warfare college where mm-hmm. they deal with propaganda and that sort of stuff. And it's like a, a, a college, a separate college, which they've got highly educated professors and so on who, who teach them about this sort of thing. And they, they, they study communism in detail and try and find all the holes in communism and point it out to the people that, that, that attend there. So I went to the Fushing Gang College quite a few times, and and there were one or two people that were sent to the the college and did uh, did courses from South Africa. So I was able to visit them there. Uh, the Kinman Defence Command I've already mentioned, and the Penghu Islands Defence Command. Uh, these are all the little islands around Taiwan, uh, close to the mainland, uh, which are going to bear the brunt of any invasion by by the Chinese. So they very 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 strongly fortified and, and, and ready for massive defensive action there. And it was extremely interesting to visit those. Um, I requested going to the headquarters of the Airborne Special Warfare Command because I had a specific interest in that, in Pindung down in the south, where there's lots of level land so they can at least parachute there and do a few things like that. Um, that that was very interesting, and I ended up going there on, on several occasions, and I had quite a good relationship with, with some of the paratroopers. I, I uh, got permission to jump with them. Uh, they gave me some refresher training, some some uh, um, conversion training for their style of jumping, and, and I, I jumped with them from C-130 and... Uh, you know, it was uh, they, they awarded me their parachute wings, and after that, every function I went to, besides my own wings, which I wore on my left chest, I put the the Taiwanese wings up as well and wore them, and um, and they liked that. You know, that was whenever I'd visit uh, one of the other units, they'd see that I had the Taiwanese wings on, and and be very pleased about that. So um, I, I I developed quite a good relationship with the paratroopers. Um, I went to one of their training areas, the Sinchu training area, which was 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 very interesting. And I also went to the Armour Research and Development Center, which was particularly interesting. They use American tanks um, and, and other armored vehicles, but they do a lot of, uh, not really conversions, but modifications on them. And they, the, uh, the, 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 they have this research and development center where they did the, those sort of things. So, so that I found quite fascinating to see their, uh, their approach to armored and mechanized uh, warfare. Um, I went quite a few times to their military academy. Uh, I had a lot of interest in that, and I wanted to see how they, they did that sort of thing. So I requested permission to go there on my own and uh, just, just look at their, the way they trained their officers. Um, I also was able to visit the Army Aviation Command. You know, like like most of most big armies in the world, the army does ha- handles most of the helicopters. They're not they're not air force aircraft. They 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 tactical aircraft used by the army. So they they have all their airborne elements, including the Army Aviation Command, under one overall overall command. 
Um, and and uh, I had a, a very, very interesting, very good visit to the Army Aviation Command in Tainan, where um, I was able to uh, to see how they employ their helicopters and uh, what sort of helicopters they have. Uh, again, mainly American stuff that they have. Um, and then I, I, I went on a very interesting visit to the, the Special Warfare Training Center at Kungguan in the in the mountains and the forests of, of, of Taiwan. The Special Warfare Training Center was where their, their Special Forces troops were trained. And they gave some demonstrations to me, and uh, they had this massive tower that they were teaching the guys to abseil from. And uh, so they said to me, uh, would, you, uh, uh, would you like to try this abseiling? So uh, I didn't tell them, you know, I'd done quite a bit of abseiling in my time, but uh, I said, yes, that would be nice. Thank you. So I went up there and uh, climbed up to the top of the tower and the guy roped me in and, you know, gave me a bit of instruction and so on. He said, no, just be very careful. And I said, yeah, no, you know, I do my best and so on. And uh kicked off and I went down and he was quite frightened when he saw, saw me go and he saw it. I stopped myself and I, you know, went and I moved around a bit. So that, that was quite, quite good. And, 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 and then he came, the instructor came down and he said to me, you've done this before, haven't you? And I said, yeah, I've done it a few times before. So that, that was very good. And then they asked me, they said, well, look, we've got our, our, our guys here who are doing some confidence training over the water, um, some new volunteers. Um, would you mind addressing them? So I said, well, you know, it'll have to be, have you got someone who can interpret for me? Because I, they, they're not going to understand my Chinese. So he said, no, no problem. You, you, you speak to them and we'll get an interpreter. So I got an interpreter and I got all these guys in front of me and I gave them a bit of a pep talk and the importance of special forces training and, you know, uh, uh, what a good job they're doing and so on. And how impressed I was with them. And, and so, you know, took quite a lot of photos there too. That, that, that was good. They, had, uh, they, they were doing good training there. And I know that one of the first visits that we sent to Taiwan back in the early 1970s um, was a visit that, uh, amongst others, Roland de Vries went on. And they did uh, uh, the, the Airborne Special Warfare course over there. And amongst others, there's a special wing that they award. And all those guys, there were, I think there were about five or six of them. Uh, or they were all already trained paratroopers, Eric Lamprecht and, uh, and Oli Holzhausen and, and uh, Shylock Mulder. Um, uh, uh, I think John Moore was one of them. Uh, so they were all either special forces or paratroopers. And, and, and they went across and did this course. And um, uh, they have a special wing that they award for rough, rough terrain parachuting. And for that, you have to jump into, into water, uh, into mountains, uh, and into forests. Um, and this, this wing has got the, the, those sort of an indication of those on, on the wing that, that you get for that. And, and all of those officers actually qualified for that. Um, so it was an early, early uh, thing. And, and, and they, when they jump into the forest, for instance, they, they wear, you know, uh, armor protection and facial protection. It looks like a... Uh, uh, pugilist, you know, these guys who use the pugil sticks when they practice bayonet drill and so on with all the padding and protection and, uh, uh, or, or maybe, uh, uh, you know, the baseball catcher who, who protects himself from the ball and so on. It was quite impressive, the stuff that they had to wear when they did, did these jumps into the forests and in the mountains. So, um, yeah. Then I, because I'd had some exposure to dogs in my early years before I joined the military, I requested a visit to their dog center, and um, that was very good. And I, I did a, uh, uh, you know, they gave me a, a detailed uh, uh, display and a uh, tour of their place, and they allowed me to take all sorts of photographs. And I drew up a very nice report on that, and I sent it back and requested that it be sent to the South African uh, uh, SADF Dog Center, which they did. And, and I was very grateful that, that the SADF Dog Center and the Navy were the only people back in South Africa who used to respond to the things that I sent them. The Navy, when I had a naval visit and I sent the report back, I'd get a reply from the Navy. Uh, if I had a, 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 and the dog center was the other one, I, the report I sent on the dog center, they sent me feedback and thanked me for what I'd done and, and told me that they got a lot of valuable information from that. So that makes it gratifying, you know, when you see that uh, the, the effort you're putting into it is, 
The, the, the Navy in, in Taiwan, I, I, I must have visited half a dozen different places there, the Logistic Command, the Naval District, um, the, the Naval Academy, uh, the Naval Hospital in Kilung, um, uh, the, 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 all of those places. It, it, it was great going to the Naval uh, setups and seeing what the Naval, the naval guys have got. Uh, I had several visits to the, the Marine Corps in Soying. Uh, they were their, their training of their Marine Corps. It's 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 very good, highly professional. Um, so you know that that went very well. Um, the Air Force also. I, I went to the Chinchuan Gang Air Force Base, uh, to the Hualien Air Force Base. Um, I went to the, the anti-aircraft with them falls under the Air Force, and I went to the anti-aircraft command. I went to the arsenals that uh, they had. Um, and, and, and then, of course, I visited a lot of the facilities of the veterans, the, the VACAs, the, the Veterans Assistant Commission for Retired Servicemen, uh, training facilities, uh, pharmaceutical production plant, uh, the Veterans General Hospital. I didn't know it at that stage, but I was to spend quite a while in the Veterans General Hospital after the hostage taking when I was recovering from my wound in my leg. Um, but uh, these are all things that they had for their veterans, and it was just so, so very, very interesting to see how they, they did that. Um, I, I had a lot of invitations while I was there. Um, I was invited to the uh, Midshipman Training Cruising Squadron in Soying. What they did was their midshipmen, their young officers that were being trained, uh, potential officers, um, they would, at the end of their training, they would go on a, uh, they would be allocated to a squadron and they would go on a, a, a training cruise. And uh, the one place that they usually went to, that they would try to go to, would be South Africa. And they'd pay a visit to Table Bay and to, to Simonstown. And, you know, the cadets, would, the midshipmen would all go into, into the city and get to learn a bit about it. It's one of the few places that they could go on an official visit to. So uh, when that uh, and that was an annual thing, and and so I, I was invited to go down and see what they were doing there, and uh, uh, to facilitate the arrangements that had to be made for that. And then the the Chinese National Day is the tenth of October, and uh, that's known as Double Ten Day because it's the tenth of the tenth. And Double Ten Day is a is a huge celebration that they have, and they normally, you know, fireworks had their origins in China. And the Chinese, they, they really understand fireworks and they know how to set up a real impressive firework display. And they would have this magnificent firework display one evening uh, for Double Ten Day. And uh, uh, the military attaches and embassy personnel would all be invited and they'd have a place on top of a building, a nice view that you could look out and where they had the display of fireworks over the the, uh, the 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 river um, it was it, it 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 was just very impressive to do that so you know it was it was great the birthday of confucius was a a big day for them so they had the chung yuen ghost festival which was another big festival that they had that you had to that you went to um uh, and then uh, one of, because we, we used to have some foreigners on our staff course as well. But of course, they all came from the pariah nations, you know, Taiwan, Israel, uh, Paraguay, uh, at one stage, Chile, at one stage, even Argentina. So, uh, you know, and, and prior to that, the people from Rhodesia, the officers from Rhodesia used to come. So, so we had some foreigners, not very many, but we normally have two or maybe even three on, on a staff course. And, and one of the Taiwanese staff students, while I had been the, the chief instructor at the Army College, um, he made contact with us as soon as we came to Taiwan. And he got married while we were there, and he invited us to the wedding. That was an experience for us, because at the wedding reception, about every half an hour, the bride would disappear. And then she'd reappear with another, another dress on. And these were absolutely stunning dresses that she, and, and so during the evening of the, the uh, reception, she probably appeared about five or six times in five or six different dresses, you know, very colorful, very beautiful uh, 
magnificent dresses that she'd appear in. And, and this was apparently the way they did it, you know. So very lavish uh, uh, reception that they went to. So it was very nice to be invited to something like that. And uh, then every year, the um, president's wife would have a, a special function that stemmed back to the, 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 the Civil War. In those days, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, wife, uh, Madame Chiang, um, quite a quite a, a, a famous person. She'd been educated in the United States. She was totally fluent in English, and she used to accompany Chiang Kai-shek wherever he went because he didn't speak any English, and she would always translate for him. And I think the people were more afraid of her than they were of him. You know, she was a she was quite an impressive person, and she was one of three sisters, the Sung sisters. And uh, they each married the other. One of them married married uh, uh, um, oh, Sun is is the name of the, um, the, the 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 sort of political leader of the the nationalists of the uh, Kuomintang before Chiang Kai Shek took over. And 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 the other one, I think, the other sister married a, a communist. So you know, they were they were very uh, very different sort of setup, but quite famous sisters these. And uh, she had this policy in those days during the Civil War that once a year she would go uh, and visit the wounded soldiers in the hospitals, and um, she would hand out red envelopes to them. Now the red a red envelope, you, it was a great thing in, in the Chinese culture to give money as a gift. And you always put money in a red envelope and you'd give it to a person. When they got a red envelope, they knew they were getting money from you. And that, unlike in our Western culture where it's sort of frowned on, you don't give people money as a gift, you know. It's a bit it's a bit, bit ostentatious and a bit rude to do that sort of thing. In the Chinese, it's a totally accepted cult cultural thing. You give people money. You put it in a red envelope and, and give it to them. And it's a great gift to, to be able to give. So... She would now visit. Now she wouldn't be able to get to all the wounded people, so she would invite other people to important dignitaries to come along, and they'd be given her on the red envelopes, and they'd hand them out on her behalf as well. So the custom arose that foreign diplomats would be invited to this occasion, and they'd meet at different hospitals, and uh, where the, the the soldiers who they weren't now wounded because there wasn't a war on. But they had, um, they were sick, or they had an injury, or something, and they were in in hospital. And the tradition was now, she would hand out red envelopes with money to all the soldiers who were in in hospital, through the the, the various people that she'd invite to accompany. Her. You wouldn't accompany her, but on her behalf, you'd go to the various hospitals and hand these things out. So um, that's that's what uh, what I had to do. So I. Um, I, I, it was on this particular hospital. I got my notification which hospital to go to, and I got my uniform together. And normally, what I would do, you know, I'd I'd put my jacket, and my tunic, and my tie. I'd hang them up in the the, the car, uh, and I'd be sitting in the back seat with them hang, hung up next to me because it was so hot. You don't wear those things all the time. And when I got to wherever I was going to, then I'd take those stuff and put them things and put them on. And so Jimmy drives me through to the hospital and Dooley parks there where all the other guys are parking. He knew all the other diplomats, uh, drivers, and they'd all sit and chat while we had to, we had to go and hand out the red envelopes. So I get out of the car and I put, a, you know, I get my tunic out and uh, my tie's not there. Now, what am I going to do? You know, now I had visions of when I was on my Spanish staff course and I left my pants behind at home and I had to try and find pants to wear. So now, now I can't go there with a tunic and, and an open neck shirt. I've got to wear a tie. And, and, and there's no time to go. It's going to take hours to drive all the way back home and get my tie. So I said, Jimmy, what am I going to do? He says, no, I don't know. I said, ask some of these guys or other drivers here, see if you can't find a tie somewhere. So he goes off and, and, you know, he comes back a little later with some multicolored tires. I said, Jimmy, I can't wear that sort of thing, man. I, uh, I've got to get a neutral color. You know, the South African army, you wear a, 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 I think it's a brown colored tie that you, you wear. A car key sort of thing, you know. So I think, what am I going to do? How am I going to manage this? 
So I'm frantic now because, you know, I've got to go and collect my, my red envelopes now. What am I, how, how am I, so I look around and, and I see my camera there. <coughs> and the, the black strap on my camera. <laughs> so I quickly unbuckle the black strap from my camera and I put it on and I tie a tie knot in it. But it only comes down about that far and it's got these two hooks on it, you see. <laughs> so I've got to pull down the, the hooks under my tunic and cover it. So a black tie looks all right, you know, it doesn't look too out of place there. So I've got my black tie on with the two hooks hidden inside my tunic cover. Uh, look at myself in the mirror in the car and I think, oh, well, that's all right. So I went and collected my tie, my red envelopes and handed out the red envelopes at the hospital to all the the, uh, the troops who were, who were lying in hospital. And they're very pleased to get there. And I'm very relieved to get back into the car because I say, yeah, Jimmy, that was that was close. And he, he laughed. He thought he thought it was very funny. But <laughs> okay, so uh, I I, uh, I think I'm 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 finished now. The the <laughs> the, the red envelopes and the, and the tie drama. So and I was I was saying that the attaches were constantly invited to tour on tours and to have demonstrations and. Once a year, they would invite all the families as well, and we'd be able to take our families. And they, they really arranged some some wonderful tours for us and treated us very, very well. Um, I had, as, I, as I've said earlier, I had an endless succession of these dinners, but fortunately, they all ended early. So they didn't mean I was worn out the next day, particularly seeing as I didn't, you know, I didn't get caught up in the, in the drinking sprees every time. There were a few other things that I had to do. Uh, I, I had to liaise with the Navy for participation in an international fleet review uh, to celebrate the South African Navy's 75th uh, anniversary. I attended a Sino-European conference, which was held in Taiwan, surprisingly enough. Um, I, I, uh, we attended the inauguration of the, uh, of the president after that presidential election. Uh, which was uh, quite impressive. Um, uh, and then uh, there was a Pacific Defense Conference held in Singapore, and I asked for permission to attend that. And they were very reluctant to grant it then in South Africa, but eventually they did because I had to fly to Singapore to attend it and stay over there and so on. So there were expenses involved. But um, uh, one has to bear in mind, and I don't think they, they fully appreciated this, but uh, in, in, in Pretoria, but uh, one has to bear in mind that the uh, that the the, uh, the the military attaché in Taiwan, the armed forces attaché in Taiwan, was the only military representative between Kuala Lumpur and Washington D.C. So that's virtually half of the world. I mean, much of it taken up by the Pacific Ocean, of course, but it's it's virtually half of the world. It's it's most of the countries in Southeast Asia had no military representation and, and uh, none of the islands, and we had no military rep representation on Australia or New Zealand. Um, so uh, I, I said to them that I felt the Pacific Defense Conference was important because it, I would be the only a representative from South Africa there. And all the, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the United States, uh, the, the, all the Southeast Asian countries, uh, Japan, uh, um, uh, Canada, they were all represented there because they were all part of the, the, uh, the Pacific, bordered on the Pacific. So uh, that was a very interesting conference. And I, I sent back a report on that as well. Of course, I never heard a word from the people in, at uh, DFR. Um, I, I, I sort of um, made myself acceptable enough to arms call for them to uh, get me to accompany them when they did a, a marketing visit to the Marine Corps with certain weapons that they wanted to, uh, to, um, to sell to the Marine Corps. I, mean, I don't know whether they ever were successful with that, but it was a very good marketing visit and that went, went very well. And of course, as I said earlier, I attended the Air Traffic Controllers Conference. And then I, I, I also, uh, because I had the time on my available in my second year, uh, the, I, I did a private study of the Chinese officer training from the time they were still uh, on the mainland until they moved to Taiwan and the developments they went through and the influence of the Americans and, and, and so on. 
Um, and I, I drew up quite a quite an interesting paper on the the, the Chinese officer training. Um, of course, none of that meant anything to them either in Pretoria. Uh, but I, I did get some sort of uh, positive uh, vibes when I I, I found that um, the, um, the 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 Americans had published in the quite prestigious uh, 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 journal, the Military Review. Um, they they had published uh, my paper on an African rapid deployment force. Uh, so you know that was in May June 1997, and I was I was quite chuffed that uh, that that happened. Uh, um, and then uh, also to my surprise, I got a uh, a, a letter uh, from the Army College, the Commandant of the Army College, who was at that stage uh, uh, Brigadier Yos Rabi. Uh, who had been one of the uh, uh, my predecessor at the brigade, and uh, who I had served under at one paraben when he was the two IC of the battalion. Uh, he was the commandant of the uh, SA Army College now, and he sent me a letter uh, with a covering letter from um, the the chairman of the the uh, SA Army Control Board, which I don't think exists anymore. But in those days, it. It consisted of uh, a number of generals, um, army generals, who, who, who sort of kept an eye on the army college and were sort of tried to to promote the army college as much as possible. Um, people who had been former commanders of the army college or, or, or commandants of the army college and, and, and so on. And the, the, the research I'd done into the staff training and the staff records, um, they had... Uh, uh, They'd done an, an, an internal publication uh, on the uh, on, on the the uh, the the, uh, the work that I'd done, uh, and so it was a it it was a, a very nicely bound and and uh, uh, very well produced cover. Uh, they they uh, publication and they the uh, the chairman who was. Uh, uh, but then Major General Berti Buerta, who had been the commandant at the Army College when I was a DS there back in 1985, uh, he said that they were so impressed with this publication of mine, this, this research that I'd done, that they were thinking of uh, producing it as a book for, for public sale. Uh, well, that never happened. I think that the, uh, the people who were keen on doing that were no, just sort of replaced by the new guys who really had no interest in what happened before 1994. But it was, uh, it was a, a bit of a, a boost to me to see that, uh, you know, my, my thing was things were getting some recognition. I ran into a bit of a problem with the, uh, with the, the uh, ROC military authorities and General Huang in particular. They held a big military exercise on Taiwan. And information appeared in the in the media about it, and I wasn't informed about it. Um, no, they don't have to inform me about it. I mean, they invite military attaches to the things that they feel they they can go to. But they had invited some of the other unofficial military attaches, including the American unofficial attaché. And you know, I, I realized all of this, so I, I wrote a letter to General Huang. And I said to him, you know, I appreciate that you have uh, the right to decide who is going to, to attend your exercises. But I feel that given the situation that we're in at the moment and the need that we want, that we're all working towards trying to get some good relationship in future for the, for the military uh, uh, with, between South Africa and Taiwan, uh, I, I'm quite offended that you didn't you didn't invite me to attend this exercise. I could have submitted a very worthwhile report on the exercise that may have played some sort of a role. Uh, anyway, General Huang was very upset about it. Uh, in fact, his staff officers, when they read the paper, they phoned me and said, look, this is going to cause unhappiness from the general. Do you really want us to send it to him, to forward it to him? Um, um, perhaps you want to reconsider what you've said here. So I said, no, I don't want to reconsider it. You send that to the general. So they did. And the general was very unhappy. And uh, it soured our relationship a bit. You know, I'd been getting on quite well with General Huang, but it soured our relationship. Uh, it didn't matter how many eggs I ate. He, he still didn't uh, 
he didn't appreciate the letter that I'd sent telling him that he should have invited me to his exercise. So um, uh, they said that, uh, you know, they, 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 they will probably be sending a, a letter of complaint about my, my letter to, to my superiors. So I preempted that and I sent a letter to General Verbeek, the, the Chief of Staff Intelligence, explaining to him, to, to him what happened and uh, said that this is what I did. If I've offended anybody by uh, breaching protocol, uh, I'm, uh, I apologize, but I do feel that uh, uh, given the situation at the moment, the Taiwanese should have invited us. We certainly invite them to all our exercises. Their attaches attend all, all our exercises. And I think it's the least they could have done was to invite me. So I got a letter back from General Verbeek and he said, no, don't worry. I, uh, I support what you said, uh, what you did, and it's, uh, you don't have to be concerned about it. So I, I never heard anything more about it. So. <laughs> um, on a private side, the, the posting in Taiwan was regarded as a hardship post, a hardship post. Um, there are certain posts, diplomatic posts, that are considered hardship posts, and you get a, a slightly better allowance, foreign allowance, when you go to those posts. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you, get an, you get extra leave. You get two holidays a year instead of just one. And for one of those every year, they fly you back to South Africa. Now, in most diplomatic posts, they'll only fly you home once every two or three years. Uh, but in a hardship post, you can go home back to South Africa once a year for one of your holidays. So uh, we made good use of that. Um, we traveled quite a bit in the east. You know, We went to places like Singapore and Phuket and, and uh, uh, Bangkok and... Um, Macau and and, and uh, uh, Hong Kong, um, and we were able to take our children there. You know, when they came on holidays from from university, and we could take them there. And, and so we had some good good holidays in the east. As a result, um, we also um, uh, were able to go home uh, back to South Africa, and we we used that to we extended it a little bit. And spent less time in South Africa and spent a bit of time in Europe as well. So we sort of flew back via Europe. And, uh, and the reason why we went to Europe was because my, uh, my sister lived in, in, in England and we were able to visit her. And uh, we had very good friends in, in Spain, uh, Medina del Campo, and we wanted to go and visit them as well. So we were able to go to Spain as well. Um, and the, a big thing was we were able to be in Stellenbosch when our daughter graduated with her with her uh, social work degree after four years at university. So um, th that was a, a, a great plus. And, and to my great surprise, when I arrived there in Stellenbosch for the, uh, for the graduation ceremony, who should I see there but General George Mayring, the Chief of the Defence Force? His son was graduating at the same time. So, <laughs> so that was a, a bit of a surprise. I didn't really have a chance to talk to him. I just greeted him. So... Um, We'd been in, in Taiwan for less than a year when President Mandela made the announcement that diplomatic relations with Taiwan would be terminated at the end of 1997, the following year. So I was left with just one year. So exactly what I told them I didn't want to have happen was now happening. Instead of a four-year posting, I got a two-year posting and I had to terminate relations, and I had to now close my office and go back to South Africa. So uh, I was very disappointed about that. We were enjoying ourselves in Taiwan. We were having a great time. We, we uh, had, had really uh, made good friends. And, uh, you know, even some of, some of the staff officers from General Huang's office, we'd become so friendly with them that I, I felt comfortable about inviting them to come to my home. And not in a, on a sort of a formal basis, bring your families, come and swim in our pool. And, you know, we'll have a picnic lunch together, uh, nothing, nothing official, just a relaxed day. And they did that and they loved it. And, you know, we, we, had, we had really good relations with those people. Um, when Mandela made the announcement, there was a change in the whole situation. I had now had a year of very great deal of activity, much things, many things happening. Many visits going on, uh, uh, frantic activity by the, on the part of the Taiwanese to try and prevent this happening, but now it had happened. And suddenly there was a drying up of access. 
they knew that we were now going to be going to the communists. And they didn't want us to have access to some of the things that they were doing and then feed that back to the communists. So suddenly I no longer had the open access that I'd had before this. Suddenly uh, it dried up. And, and, and um, although there was still an intensification in, of invitation by the Chinese, or by the, so the Taiwanese to South African senior officers to try and get them over because they had to now try and negotiate the best possible deal without diplomatic representation, to try and get something like the Americans and the French and the Israelis and so on had over there. Um, but I, I found that suddenly I didn't have a lot of work. I didn't have as much work as I'd had before. So uh, I, uh, I decided to enroll with UNISA and do an honors degree in history uh, so that I could at least use my time profitably, which is what I, I, I'd started doing. Um, we'd also had a lot of private visitors, you know, friends that had come, come through to visit us in Taiwan because we'd said we were staying here. If you can get to Taiwan, uh, we'll give you a good holiday while you're here. And, uh, and, and quite a few people came out. Of course, we had our daughters came out quite often, uh, you know, Melanie and Shona. Um, Melanie's boyfriend at university, Walter de Toy, uh, he came out and spent a while there with us as well, uh, while Melanie was there. My, cousin, uh, my cousin's son, uh, Matthew Simmons, uh, he came out to Taiwan to learn to speak Taiwanese. So he came out to spend a year there. And he stayed with us for a couple of weeks while he was looking around to find accommodation and so on. And he moved into a Chinese neighborhood and he, he learned to speak Mandarin pretty well in that year because he made a point of immersing himself. He just finished the university, he'd been at Wits, and he now went there and, and learned the, uh, the language pretty well and you know, lived in there with the Chinese in a Chinese neighborhood and so on. Um, there was a fellow called Roger Smith that we had met in England. My cousin who was living in England, her husband was a musician and he played in an in, in orchestra with Roger Smith. Uh, he didn't come out, for, but, but uh, the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields Chamber Ensemble, uh, this fellow Roger Smith played for them and he came out. And, you know, he gave us an invitation, uh, free tickets to attend the concert that they had. And so we spent time with him there as well, which was rather nice. Um, Melanie's boyfriend's parents, uh, Picky and Peter Dutoy, who came from Rawsonville, they were wine farmers in that area. Uh, we invited them to come out and they came and, and, and spent a holiday with us as well. And we took them all over the place. Um, one of the, uh, the guys uh, uh, came out under, I think, Donnell's auspices. He worked for, um, gosh, I forget the name of the place. It is the, 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 the missile uh, uh, factory in, in Centurion or the missile organization. He worked over there. Ian McFadden, he was uh, at school with me in Poch. And he came out and so he was able to spend a bit of time with us and, and that we really enjoyed. My sister's former mother-in-law, Nina Jacobsburg, she was a survivor of, uh, 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 she'd been in, uh, uh, a Jew in Austria when the Nazis uh, uh, arrived on the scene and she'd managed to escape from Austria as a young child and um, very interesting lady, a very li alive, vital person. She was very old at that stage, but she was quite happy to go wandering around all over the world and visiting places. So she came out and, you know, Anne took her all over the place and that was quite pleasant too. And then our very good friends, Colonel James Hills and uh, his wife, Wendy, they came out and spent a holiday with us there. And that was wonderful. We took them all over the place. And that was quite an eye-opener for James, seeing the way they, because he was farming by then. He was no longer in the military. <coughs> but it, it was just interesting for him to see how intensive farming was done by the, uh, the Taiwanese over there. And um, we had a very, some interesting rides all over the place. We took them down to the, the uh, 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 Kending uh, National Park in the south, and we hired scooters and we drove around all over the place with that. So, you know, we had we had a lot of fun with the people that came out there. And those that were young enough to participate, we would take them white water rafting on 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 the on the Shiukuluan Shi River, uh, which um, 
uh, which had nice rapids and and you know we could go and have a really really good time taking them on 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 those sort of things and so that was that was great fun one of the strange things that happened and i i could never understand it now the announcement's been made that at the end of 1997 we we're di terminating diplomatic relations with uh, with taiwan to open up on on beijing in and on the mainland but uh, halfway through 1997 the the term of Ambassador Phil Yun, who'd been there now for his period, I don't know how long they spent there, quite a few years that they spent in one place, his term ended. So they sent a replacement for him. Uh, uh, Nikki Skoltz came to be, become the replacement ambassador. So now there's only six months left before we terminating relations and the old ambassador goes back home and the new ambassador arrives. I don't know how the foreign affairs do it. They, you know, they don't have a handing and taking over. The old ambassador goes home, and there's nobody there. And then the new ambassador comes and he arrives, and and there's no handing and taking over. That's apparently the way they do it. And so this guy's got to pick up everything from scratch. But but he knows that in six months' time, uh, he's no longer going to be an ambassador. What he did do then was he stayed on as a as a sort of liaison officer. But I mean, now he's downgraded. He's, why didn't they just leave this other ambassador there for the last six months so that he could... But, but you know, that's that's the way they uh, they do their things. So, um, I, 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 you know, I don't... I can't really comment on that. It just didn't seem to make much sense to me. But now the new ambassador's got to go and present his credentials to the, to the president. And, I, you know, I went along for this whole big formal performance of him presenting he asked me to accompany him i got on very well with a new ambassador in fact he, he he made far more use of me than the previous ambassador did he came on several visits with me and you know i did, could invite him when i went to visit some of the units and so on and he would come with me and and um we had a very good relationship um but now we go into this formal presenting of credentials he knows that in six months' time, uh, his credentials are now going to come to an end. And the president, who is now accepting his credentials, also knows that. So to me, it was a bit of a farce, you know. I, I really didn't understand what they were doing. And towards the end of that year, that uh, 1997, during the last six months, uh, our daughter Melanie was now doing her master's at Stellenbosch in medical social work. She got permission from the university to do a practical phase of her course at a hospital in Taiwan, uh, working with AIDS patients and doing the social work uh, around that. And so she came out and she stayed with us for, you know, I can't remember how long, about four, four, three or four months that she was with us over there, um, right at the end of our, of our stay in Taiwan. And uh, this, was, this was quite nice having her there. She was 22 years old at that stage. and. Uh, um, and while she was there, she went along to a little, to a, 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 a sort of a, a children's home where there were a whole lot of babies uh, and children who were waiting to be adopted. And most of them were being adopted uh, by Western countries. So they were going to be leaving the country. And they were waiting in this home now until the adoptions came through. And there was one little baby lying there on the floor. And, and she said, she looked at the baby and picked him up and she said to the people, um, uh, you know, I'll just take this one home with me. And they said, uh, yeah, sure, you can do that if you want. And so she said, are you serious? So she said, yeah, as long as you just look after him when we need, when we need to send uh, him, you, when we need to send him to uh, his adoptive parents in America, then you just bring him back. So she said, well, you know, I'll just check with my mom. And, and, and so that's what we did. We, this little guy, his name was Zachary. Uh, and and uh, he, he was at that stage two old. Well, yeah, about two months old. So he was a tiny little baby. So we brought him home. And uh, he stayed with us in, eventually for, yeah, I think, I think yeah, about five months that he was with us. And... Um, so now Zachary was uh, part of our family, the same as what we do with little babies now. You know, we get little babies all the time and they come and stay with us for a few months until their situation is sorted out. 
<coughs> and then I was busy with my final preparation for departure and to change the status, of the, the, the change of the status of the embassy. Uh, but there wasn't any provision made for a military person to remain behind. Uh, nobody was going to replace me and I wasn't going to stay. I was told, you're coming back home, we're going to deploy you back to the army. Um, so I had to close up my office and uh, I had to basically get rid of Carol and Jimmy, my uh, secretary and my driver, which was quite heartbreaking for me because, you know, they had good jobs with us and they, had, they hadn't done anything wrong. And now suddenly they've got to go and they've got to find other work, uh, uh, which they both needed badly. So, you know, I gave them very good testimonials and uh, I had to just hope that they would, would find something because the embassy couldn't employ them. They had, didn't have any need for more people. So it was, it, it was very sad. Uh, and it wasn't a very happy sort of thing. You know, I, I couldn't, and, and you can't sell anything in Taiwan that is secondhand. They don't accept secondhand things. Uh, they believe that it's bad feng shui. That's bad luck. Uh, if, if, if there's anything bad has happened to the person who owned that thing before, that bad luck can be passed on to you if you take possession of that. So you can't sell secondhand cars. You can't sell secondhand fridges. You can sell nothing secondhand there. You buy something new or you don't, you don't have it at all. And, and once a year, they will turf out all sorts of old things. They want to get new things. And they just put them on the pavement, fridges and TVs and, and other things that they don't want. And nobody will take them. They've got to be carted away and, and, and dumped in, uh, in, a, in a rubbish dump. Uh, except the Filipino uh, workers. There were a lot of Filipino workers in, in Taiwan. And um, they were domestic workers and, and, and things like that, you know, and often they worked for expatriates. And we had a, a, a maid who worked for us, um, who uh, we could afford to, to have there. And that was very useful for Anne because Anne was doing a lot of uh, military, you know, uh, support work as well for me. So she wasn't always at home. And um, she would accompany me on many of my visits and my uh, to functions and things like that. So... So uh, Lina, this girl from uh, the Philippines, she had the, the servants' quarters in the garage down below, the very big uh, quarters that she had there. And we actually inherited her from our predecessor. She'd already been in his employ, and so we just took her over when we came there. And um, Lina would, uh, and all her Filipino friends, when the, the Chinese New Year came around in about February, uh, all the stuff would be turfed out on the pavements. And they were all the other Filipinos. They go around searching for stuff. And there's nothing wrong with the stuff. The people are just want to replace. They want to get new stuff. And the Filipinos would take the stuff and they'd bring them in. And, and what they could keep in use, they would. And what they could package and send back to the Philippines, they would send back and so on. So, so they were the only ones that you could get secondhand stuff to. <coughs> and then we were about two months from going back home permanently. But now I had to get my office closed in those two months. And we got a message to say that Anne's dad was very, very ill. He was, he was quite old. He was 80 years old. And um, uh, it, it, it looked bad. It looked as if he wasn't going to make it. So uh, I got permission for her to fly back. So she flew back. And... Uh, even before uh, anything, I'd, I'd been told that, that you know, it, he's, he's not going to make it. So you'd better come as well. So I got permission and I got, and before I got back to, to South Africa, he died. So we were down there in the Cape uh, for the funeral and so on, and to give her mom a bit of support and, and so on. And then we, we went back to, uh, to Taiwan. Um. And it was less than two weeks after we got back from his funeral that uh, the hostage taking took place. Six weeks before we were due to leave Taiwan. Well, internet, we've come to the end of this episode. General, thank you again. We appreciate your time. Uh, next week is going to be very interesting also because we're talking about your further ordeal where uh, you now want to leave Taiwan, coming back home, and then an unfortunate incident happens and you and your family is taken hostage.
And you even wrote two books about it, one book in English, one in uh, Chinese, in Mandarin. So to all of you who's listening here, don't miss that episode. It's really good. It's the greatest um, story I've ever heard regarding faith in our Lord. And I'm sure you will be looking forward to hear it next week. But until that time, if you have a story to tell me, just contact me and we will put the motions in place to get you recorded. Until we meet again, God bless.